bold journalist. But Drew Hernandez is a strong-minded individual. Exposing lawlessness. Drew Hernandez, who is uh, ideological. Finding the truth. And use the word Antifa. This is what they do. Battling their lives. The most mobs, all they can do is lie. These are the front lines. Welcome to TPUSA Live. My name is Drew Hernandez, host of Frontlines. We have some great stuff coming up on the live stream today. Here on Frontlines, I'm bringing in special guest Elijah Schaefer to talk about the latest push in favor of the trans agenda. Targeting kids, the headlines never end. After that, we will send it over to the TPUSA Live couch where they're talking about gun rights in America and the newest additions to the school board watch list. And then Human Events Daily host Jack Posobiec is exposing the latest numbers surrounding the skyrocketing fentanyl deaths across the United States of America. Then John Root takes it from there on Breakaway. He's talking about how cancel culture actually led to the creation of the show. And he opens up about his faith, dating, and politics. We'll wrap up the stream with Poplitics with Alex Clark, who has the scoop on a potential new high school musical movie. And by the way, all you thought criminals out there, Frontlines is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other streaming services. Don't forget to subscribe. Leave a five-star review now. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, smash that like button, hit the notification bell, and share this video now. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere else, please reshare this transmission right now. My name is Drew Hernandez, and you are now on the front lines. But before we get into that, do you know you can get steakhouse-quality beef, chicken, and seafood delivered right to your door with Good Ranchers? They aren't like other meat boxes. boxes. Over 85% of grass-fed beef is imported from overseas, but Good Ranchers only sources 100% American beef. Their supply chain is honest and transparent every step of the way. These are real American people trying to help real American businesses. And I think that's a cause we can all get behind. Now you can do good while you eat good. When you purchase your box of Good Ranchers, meet with our code TPOSA. They will donate $50 to us here at Turning Point USA on your behalf. Head on over to GoodRanchers.com slash TPOSA today to solve your meat problem and donate to us. Order now with code TPOSA to get $50 donated to our mission here. Now is the time to support American farms and ranches. Make what we do here and all over the country possible with one small purchase. Tell whoever buys the meat in your house to go to GoodRanchers.com slash TPOSA and get your box today. Like I said, I'm your host, Drew Hernandez. You are now on the front lines, and with me now is the great and wonderful, most notorious white man on the face of planet Earth, <laughs> Elijah Schaefer, host of Slightly Offensive Superstar on Blaze TV. Yeah, well, I think that was a, a lot of lies. I thought you were a Christian, <laughs> so that's actually interesting. You started this out with actual dishonesty to your audience. There's I'm not brown. Much... I can get away with it. I can just <laughs> lie and say whatever I want. Haven't you heard? You can lie about all the races. That's the nice thing. It's like I can, <laughs> I can only lie about some races. There's, of course, one or two that are still off limits. And the North Koreans, we'll just leave them out because for, for, for the sake of it, if I want to visit there and I don't want to be executed, you know, for, <laughs> for my existence. But I think overall, I'm happy to be here. You know, people have called me racist. I'm on a show with a Mexican. How could I be? I mean, I'm, I'm Hispanic, and they call me a white supremacist. Anyways, <laughs> but, but, but what, what, what else is new? I well, love my Mexicans, Trump. <laughs> They're the greatest... They make the greatest kuhani lote. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> the great MAGA king. Yeah. Anyways, well, let's get straight into this because the targeting of children, the left just wants to sexualize kids every step of the way. We see this headline after headline after headline, and here we are. Post Millennial reports that Target launches trans merch for kids as well Ooh. as chest binders and packing underwear. Target is now selling chest binders for girls. These binders are meant to be worn over the chest to suppress uh, visibility of breasts and create the look of a flat chest. Girls typically do this in order to appear more masculine. The binders are marketed to biological girls and women who identify as transgender and non-binary. Reaction. Um, we have always had these available for our ankles. Um, you ever sprained your ankle, you can get an ankle binder. Um, I don't know if it was really meant to, you know, smooth out your, your bone and to, you know, bring less shape. I thought it was for stability. And um, we've also had something for breasts. They're called bras and they keep them in place, specifically training bras that people can wear. So they've remarketed the training bra um, and meant like, hey, 
you're already overpaying for this at Lululemon. Why don't we waste more of your money and buy this chess binder? Because God knows how many women are just really trying to push the trans agenda at Target. I gotta say this, I hate this, this is the worst trade deal ever. I want the dog back, Target. I just wanna be back to the dog and free popcorn when you walked in, and now I got trans chess binders, bad trade. And I mean, they're, they're obviously targeting children with this stuff, and it's like, it's like, Pornographic, which is is is, is horrific. Is it's, it really? It's, it's disgust. I mean, listen, this picture right here behind us. Can I see uh, for research purposes Tom, only? Tomboy X makes underwear and activewear <laughs> that anybody can feel comfortable and confident in, regardless of where you fall on the size of the gender spectrum. They say Target touts about the new product. Models who have undergone Ooh. double mastectomies to make their bodies appear more masculine. Masculine are also featured in Target's advertising of the new lingerie line. Now, we've obviously blurted some of this stuff out because it is pretty much borderline pornographic because that's not a real, right? That's not a real male. This, this, this right here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is not a real male. This is a female saying that they're a male that's mentally ill. This is why we blotted it out because it's pornographic. They're just allowed to be naked in front of Target to advertise to children. And TikTok does this crap too. Yeah, um, so a couple <laughs> things. Uh, you can remove your boobies, but you are still a woman. Uh, there's objectively, you're, you're not able to change that. You're not a man. Being a man is not just not having breasts because let's just be frank. To my fatties out there, there's something called gynecomastia. Men have boobies. Some of them do. And part of being a man is literally growing a strong and large pex. It's actually creating that barrel movement. And when you just suck this out, you have a problem. You have a mental disorder. This is a, what you know, it's a, it's like a, it's like a trans fad that people are moving and, and growing with. And I don't know where Target, who they're appealing to, and I think it's ironic that we're making trans people Target, you know, like, that we're trying to make them not the Target. Target is targeting children. Children, yeah, and also too, like, I love this too, where they're like, they, they walk around being like, yeah, what we all were asking for at Target was for chest binders. No, could you have my size available in underwear? Could start there, you know, could you have your products on the shelves? Maybe you would hire an employee to work at the front. Um, and they're like, okay, we heard your, your, your complaints. Let's give you trans underwear. It's gross, and also the scars, it's not a good look. Oh, Women, the stop the chopping clothing, off the breasts. Listen, listen, for Please. people that are like, oh, this is for adults, all the libertarians and the people that are like, oh, just live and let live. Well, look, this is targeting children. Here's a picture of the new clothing line in Target. They pride toddler trans <laughs> project short sleeve t-shirt, pride kids pronouns short sleeve round neck t-shirt, and the coral co cover. Of course, they have inclusivity, right? Uh, people of color, but look at the t-shirt. She, her, they, him, sis. It's right there. What does the little shirt say? The little kid, trans rights are human rights. There it is. Little kid on the left is wearing a t-shirt that says trans rights <laughs> are human rights. It's targeting the little kids. Black people don't even like trans people in general in the United States. That's a gen genuine truth. I mean, I was at a trans protest the other day. Oh, that's 100% true. Right. Very and, like, and I was like so surprised. There were so many black Americans that were, that were there. And so we decided to do some investigations with the people I was with about why they were there. Uh, this could come across wrong, but this is the truth answer. They said they just wanted to be there to hype and wild out. So they didn't care about the trans issues. They were just, they brought music and were twerking and stuff. And that's cool, man, have a party. I'm actually, what, co-opt the pro-trans rally with your twerking. I'd rather, ha hopefully you're having fun than trying to mutilate children. But it's like, there's not a really a huge uh, congruency with a traditionally more conservative group of people um, that people don't realize, you know, they go, oh, well, black people have problems with, with, with violence or different things. Yeah, a lot of that's like poverty driven and it's, there's, there's other issues. But inside the families, I mean, you'll see like a gangster who's afraid to still piss off his mom. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that even in the worst South Side Chicago where there's, you know, the, the issues that people tend to, to label black people with, his mom's not okay with it. And if he, his mom's probably less okay if he came home trans. Like, that's 100% like, true. Sure. I've talked about this with Stephen Davis here at Turning Point where that's kind of like this forbidden conversation where they don't want to talk about how like really racist and homophobic the black community is within itself, even Hispanics. I'll tell black you right trans now. Black trans lives matter. Tell you. 
black trans lives matter is their number one phrase. And mm -hmm. the reason why the, the trans people that are getting killed are black trans people because, and their clients are mostly black and they're, you know, just like a Happy Meal comes with a toy that's a surprise, but you expect it coming. When you get a trans prostitute, that comes with a surprise that probably you didn't expect. Yep. And, uh, you know, maybe the Twin Towers fell, but when a new tower erects in front of your face and you realize uh, the only thing that's going to fall is the person that you believe tricked you. And that's a, actually a genuine, that's the problem, is in the black communities with the prostitutes and with the trans people getting killed. So there's not an epidemic of trans people being murdered. There's not an epidemic of black trans people being murdered, but there is a problem specifically in lower income neighborhoods with trans black prostitutes and sex work. And no one wants to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the black community is not promoting transgenderism. That's not even an issue they care about. When you ask them, so they put a kid up there, they're just trying to get back for the time when they, uh, I think it was, was it, oh, it was H&M, right, that did the Mama's Little Monkey or whatever oh, yeah. with the black kid. And everyone, got, for all everyone got mad and mm -hmm. it was like, I'm sorry, you think black people look like monkeys, that's, that's on you. I think we call kids monkeys because they're crazy. Well, because and we know crazy. the real leftists are the real racists. Right, but I was like, mean, like, like, like but I'm actually am offended by this. Like, you, like I'm gonna get my kid a shirt that said like schizophrenia is cool. You know. Yeah. Well, speaking of the mentally ill, Calvin Klein ran a pregnant trans man Ew, ad gross. on Mother's Day. Gross. Race for impact. Uh, it's pretty disgusting. Some of the images that we've seen. I mean, if you take a look at the actual ad. There it is. We had to blot that out too because that is not a I man. I like that. Can I just say I like I like censoring out trans nipples. I, well, we I, had I'm that's a female. That's a female. I know, but it's that's weird. We should. We it's weird. It. It's so weird to see this because I think that's part of the demoralization where they want you to start to feel comfortable to see pornographic images out in the open on a Calvin Klein ad where little kids are walking back and forth. That is still a female. That is still a woman. But just because they've had the reduction surgery, oh, it's okay, it's okay to be out in nude, out in public now, with little kids just seeing this and watching. They do this on TikTok, if you go on TikTok, yes. they do the same, the same freaking Dude. thing, where kids get the surgeries, yes. right? And little girls get the surgeries that think that they're, that they're men or they're boys. They get the surgeries and they take to TikTok with their clothes off and TikTok allows it. It's, it's disgusting. Bro. But they want us to be <laughs> in this place where we're demoralized it's and it's normal. No, I saw someone do that. I was at a, at, a, at a protest at University of North Texas, and this girl pulls up her shirt, and she's, uh, you know, got the scars, the shame, and she's got the, the mastectomy. And it's like, dude, first of all, this is such a female behavior. Like, guys don't flash their breasts at anyone. Maybe I do, um, and that's just off camera to you because you requested it. But, um, but, but for the most part, it's like, no guys walking around being like, look at my boobs, look at my boobs. That's like, you know, at a concert, a girl will do that or something like that, and guys wanna see that. But then they still carry that into like, when they think they're a man, look at my scars, look at my breasts. Bro, nobody wants to see that. It's gross, it's weird. And also, the, that surgery is specifically for people who are going through like cancer. And it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is a maiming and destructive surgery that is intended to be a last option resort so that people don't die. And, and, and you go, well, that's because it's helping me to not commit suicide. Dude, the, the, the fallacy that the, the trans surgeries are helping people, they're still 19 times more likely to commit suicide after the full surgery than a Nothing normal changes. person. It's not actually medical consensus and it's not doing anything. And they're using these surgeries like that we, you know, you, we, penile reconstructive surgery and, and uh, vaginoplasty and different things that we have were meant to correct problems that were natural or in accidents, but you weren't supposed to become the accident on purpose. Yeah. And that's, so it's like, it, it's, so it's, it, it, it's like, it's breaking apart even the trust in the medical system because with the Hippocratic Oath, these surgeries were meant to make people's lives better, but instead you're maiming someone and the likelihood they're probably still gonna kill themselves. I mean, but this is, this is mental illness, okay? You take a look at that picture, and that individual, I mean, it, you have to be a woman to have a baby. A, a man cannot have a baby, but the only way that the psychopath mentally ill left can prove that men could get pregnant <laughs> is if a female gets pregnant and tries to look like a man to prove that a man could get pregnant. It, it, this is mental illness. It is mental illness across the entire board, and they want it to be normalized. It should never be normalized, but speaking Speaking of further mental illness and the targeting of children, you guys remember iCarly? A little show iCarly and like the, I guess like the director and the producer. Have you seen those YouTube videos where he had like a weird foot fetish and there's always like feet? In the yeah, I think right? I think I think the directors might have been kitty diddlers, right? But, but high but, high possibility. And and that's no surprise, right? But now they're taking it a step further, out in the open, 
So, I mean, iCarly season two has been rebooted. They try and change the whole thing. But now there are straight drag queens in iCarly season two. RuPaul's drag queen uh, race queens get new drag names in iCarly season two. Carly Shay, Shantae, you stay. <laughs> RuPaul's Drag Race Olympics. <laughs> Candy. Uh, here, here are the names. Candy. The drag queens in iCarly too. Candy Muse, Scarlet Envy, Monique Hart, and Rose guest star on the upcoming iCarly episode titled "I Dragged Him," which premieres on May 13th on Paramount Plus. What, is, what does this sound like? A night with Bill Cosby. You know what I mean? I dragged him. It's like it just sounds like it just sounds like it's, I don't I don't know where we get this stuff. Also with drag queens, like, it's like, I, does it come from the fact they used to be dragged behind cars or that the Muslims are still doing that to them in their countries? I don't know. But I, I, I think about it and I go, drag queens are gross. They're, they're, the whole point of drag too comes of like, you know, embracing this, um, you, I, I, think, I think it's more embracing the exaggeration of what people are, are, are putting on the gay community in a lot of ways, right? And so they, they like try to get nasty or grosser. And it was like meant to be something that was like at these clubs and nighttime things. And I, even in LA, it was only the last couple of years that I started seeing people walking out in public in drag. I feel like this was more of like a closeted type thing that, it, that existed. I mean, when I was a drag queen for 10 years of my life. This is a kid show. Well, I know, I know. I was just, the only reason why I'm mad about this is they didn't invite me to go on iCarly as, a, as my, in my drag queen. I, I'm, I'm Miss Syphilis, which is, uh, I'm well, trying to names, warn like, people about, the, now their, about, their names about are, sexual Their names are changing. So they were like trans people, but now that they're drag queens. So Monique Hart is becoming anti-histamine. Rosé is Sounds now. Like allergic reaction? <laughs> I'm, I'm <feeling> like, <laughs> Rosé is now Kimmy Kimmy Moore. Candy Muse portrays Cruella Tensions. Cruella, t- <laughs> like, and Scarlet Envy plays Lana Del Slay. It's not even Kids creative. Show. It's show. not even. It's not even creative. <laughs> it, you know, it's not. Like I think of guillotines. I don't know why I'm thinking of that. Cruella tensions. Bro. Yeah, it's like it's. I just people have just gone to the point to where I, I don't think we can expect less than the madness of having these people being given to our kids. I mean, the, the, they want to pervert the children, we know that, but we're past the grooming of kids. It's like, three years ago, I was in a podcast with, with Fleckas, and we were saying that it, very soon, you're gonna be the bigot if you don't let them have sex with your kids. Yeah. And everyone thought it was, I, I was told to censor that, like, that is such a nasty statement. Nope. I say unpopular things, and I say nasty things, because it's true. Yeah. You, can, you will eventually oh, be like, seen I'm as a bad person. I'm the nasty one, because I'm just pointing out what these people are literally doing and what they want to do. Yeah, and it's like, it's like they're the kind Same of people crap, where you're like, an old, you're gonna ask them like, oh, hey, I think there's a pedophile in the building, and you ask the drag queen, they're like, I don't know of any pedophiles, it's just you and that cute six-year-old over there across the street, and they look at you like, they don't even know what a pedophile is anymore. Like they literally are into kids, and that's the whole point. Is like they already have the sexual attraction for children. They're just upset that it has to be called pedophilia right mm-hmm. now, and so they they need to make the kids. That's the key thing. And and you see this. Do you know you know how you see this? I you know that the, that that they're changing the language so kids become more comfortable with being sexually abused because Mm -hmm. number one, they're calling sexual abuse trauma, Mm -hmm. not sexual abuse anymore. So it's just trauma. And it's trauma because the way it was handled. And then on um, porn sites, and I'm not gonna say porn, porn, pornographic sites where you're looking like hardcore stuff, but um, sites with adult themes that would still be considered uh, 18 or older, Instead of it saying, and, and I and I went on that that Amaze cartoon. You covered those people too. Yeah. That legally had to have warnings because of the nudity about the pornographic content on the website, but it did not say, "Are you 18 and older? Yes or no." It said, "Are you 18 and older? Yes, I'm mature enough." That's what's the point. Not yes, mm. I'm 18. Yes, I'm mature enough. Mm. So they're already trying to trying to trying to take down the distinction of like a legal age yeah. to have sex, and they're saying, "Oh, but are you mature enough?" Which you know. It, I mean, it's statutory rape obviously is a different legal matter than, than straight up molesting children, but they're not talking about tr- statutory rape with a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old. These are like 40-year-old men dressed as women that want to have sex with your six-year-old son. Yeah, it's, that's but, what but it is. But you get age restricted on on your podcast. I'm age restricted when they want, I, and the, the age restriction that I want to remove is on my videos so people can see them. The age restriction they want to remove is so that they can marry a child. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's weird. It's no surprise. They're they're going after this, and 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 I mean. Here's some more evidence to prove what we're saying. Uh, the Post Millennial revealed teachers brag about ignoring parent requests to use children's birth name 
and pronouns. In a recently uncovered virtual meeting with elementary school staffers, it was revealed these employees were bragging about ignoring requests from parents for their children to be referred to by their birth names and their pronouns. A virtual meeting titled Creating and Sustaining GSAs in Elementary Schools, held over Zoom on April 26th, saw moderator Katie Butler, a second grade public school teacher at Harvey Milk Civil Rights Academy in San Francisco, issued a question to her fellow panelists regarding student pronoun usage. Take a look at the answers. What should we do if a parent requests that we refer to their child by the pronouns associated with their sex, assigned at birth instead of their preferred pronouns or their pronouns? Um, and what, and that we use their legal name instead of a student's chosen name. Um, here at school, um, the, the expectation is that all of my students feel comfortable and welcome in my classroom. So in my classroom, I will refer to your child by whatever name and pronouns that they've told me they feel most comfortable with. There it is. I don't care what you say, mom or dad. I don't care what your child's name is. I don't care what biological sex mm. your child is. I don't care what you want for your children. It's always like this. I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want. Your child is mine. Your child belongs to me. That's the heart of these people. Yeah, they they the do arc? it right there on, on camera. It's like out in the open. That's what I'm trying to look Screw you, up. mom and dad. I'm going to do what I want with your child because they belong wow. to the state and they belong to me. That's what I'm just saying. Like, I'm just trying to like, process this right now. You know, I feel like I feel like a frozen dinner that only got 30 seconds in the microwave. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just like, just like a waste, right? I, I don't even know what to do with with myself when I hear teachers think, "Oh, yeah, we just want gay people to get married," and it's like, "Hey, guys, this is a slippery slope." Because no, we uh, want your kids. That's because what they want. well, yeah, but I'm saying like when we didn't put it to a vote, we put it to a vote and we voted against it, and then the court overturned it. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, because this is what's going to happen then when you stop responding and respecting people's requests and what they want for their own family and their own lives. And teachers think that they have the right to raise your child more than you do. Yep. This is the state. And I don't I, I don't remember when teachers became activists like this. Like when I when I was younger, like I, a lot of my teachers had problems, I think you could kind of tell. You could tell the alcoholic teacher, you could tell mm -hmm. um, I mean I got a teacher, you know, in high school tell, explain to me how to find good vodka and you know, I mean I had weird teachers, right? Weird teachers. But like I didn't have teachers trying to like push men mental illness, you know. Like, I mean, there was classrooms for people who had these problems, mm -hmm. and now they're. I mean, there have been teachers that have molested you? kids, that have raped kids. I mean, that's been happening for. But now it's just out in the open. It's out in the open. Your kid belongs to me, whether you like it or not. I don't care what your kid's name is. I don't care what they identify as. I will do what I want with your kid. Yeah, and, and I mean, these people shouldn't just be fired. They should be prosecuted. Yeah. Um, it's like, uh, and I was called prostate cuted because that's what they're going after on our kids. I mean, mm -hmm. let's just be completely well, it's straight grooming because they're not. It's literally grooming, Elijah. I mean, here, here's another story. The National Science Teaching Association mm -hmm. Conference for kindergarten K through 12 teachers called Queer Your Classroom held a conference and they're, they're setting up like kids like to come out of the closet. They're setting up like these little... Uh, activities for these kids to do this. The loser in the video suggests you can identify kindergarteners based on their sex organ functions. Take a look at this. Tips on how you can be a better intersex ally. When it comes to inclusive language, oftentimes people tend to use phrases like people with penises or people with vaginas, rather than saying male and female or men and women. While this can absolutely be inclusive for trans people, unfortunately it's not always the most inclusive language for intersex people. My advice is to use language that focuses on function and not just form. That means focusing on the actual function that you're talking about, such as people who can get pregnant, people who can get other people pregnant, people who are at risk of testicular cancer, and so on and so forth. This is much more inclusive because there are intersex people who are born with a vagina but don't have a uterus or ovaries or an ability to menstruate. This is because some people that are born with a penis don't have testes. So it's much more inclusive to say what you actually mean than it is to use language that works around that. So for the viewers and the listeners, what she's saying is you should identify children and explain to them, come down to their level, identify their gender based off of the function of their genitals. That's what she's saying. Where is Kyle Rittenhouse when you need him, you know? <laughs> That's all. When I watch these people, I have no other thoughts. I need some, some justice. Um, maybe it's weighed out in lead, and I don't know. I, I just don't have a lot of positive thoughts for uh, people who, you know, flirt with the idea of, 
um, anally raping children. Uh, that's literally what they're trying to do, and, 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 and I need to put that out there. It's a strong phrase, but that's what it is, because children do not give consent, okay? When your prefrontal cortex has not developed, when your, your, your testicles have not, um, you know, dropped and, and, and grown, and when a woman's ovaries have not fully developed, et cetera, um, and particularly, by the way, they're not really going as much after young girls or going after the young boys, and that's mm -hmm. why I focus on this. Um, you know, in a just world, your life wouldn't exist because we wouldn't tolerate these things. And, and people need to realize it, the grooming is not a joke. It's not an exaggeration. It's, it's, it's they're trying to get you comfortable with kids having a sexuality. Yeah. Kids don't have a sexuality. There's a, literally a reason why we have a discipline called sexual development, because there is an age, sometimes it starts around 10 years old, where there is this, this movement, your SRY genes, different things are activated, you have your, your SOX9 and the different types of regulators, then you start to produce different amounts of testosterone, genitals enlarge, things like this happen, and you know what? That's between a kid and their parents. And if you're interested outside of maybe being a science teacher or somebody's parents or even a guardian to help a kid through that moment of their life, if, you wanna, if you're intentionally inserting yourself into there, you are, to me, a potential child molester, and yeah. and and you are a child threat. predator. These you are, are child th predators. You are a threat, and threats and, need to be neutralized. Yeah, and we we don't advocate for killing people. I mean, we could sit here and just pretty much tell you and report to you that these people are literally telling you to your face that your children belong to them, and they're willing to do what they want with your children without your consent. And I mean, here's even further. Proof. They want your consent. They want you to approve of it. Yeah, they they, they yeah. They it's act, either you you approve of it. Forced. Forced, forced approval, right? Like a gun to your head, a gun to your head, they want to have sex with your kids and make you praise them yeah. and talk about how they're so brave and stunning. Yeah, they're the violent ones. They're the ones firebombing pro-life offices, okay? We're just sitting here showing you and unmasking who these people are. They're right. doing it out in the open. So here's further evidence. A Missouri school approved a coming out the closet event where students can get chest binders and clothing to express their new gender identity transition closets have been popping up at various schools across the country. Take a look, here's the report. So earlier tonight, the school board approved a grant application from Rockbridge High School's Gay Straight Alliance Club. GSA will apply for $10,000 from the It Gets Better project for a clothing closet to allow students to express themselves at school. The closet's called Coming Out of the Closet in Style. The GSA club had the chance to revise its proposal in the past month and present it to the board tonight, and the board approved it. The new proposal that was approved focuses more on the Rockbridge High School community rather than national trends and attitudes. An appointed opponent of the idea says it was exclusive to only allow LGBTQ plus students access the closet. However, in the application, students reiterated that the closet is for everyone. A parent in support of the meeting tonight said GSA has been life-changing for her child. Reporting live in Columbia, Emma Cronin, KOMU 8 News. There they are. They're facilitating. Okay, this is what groomers do. They facilitate for your children to come out of the closet. And lastly, if these teachers, if you're not convinced yet, Here's a, from Libs of TikTok, another teacher that has come out of the closet to her students and her school as a trans person. Here's what it said on Instagram. First day of school. Today was extra special because as of today, I am completely and totally out to all my teachers, administrative staff, and students. School was the last context at which I was still using he, him pronouns and my former name. So they're facilitating your kids coming out of the closet. They're saying that your kids belong to them. They'll do what they want with your kids. And now they're coming out to your kids personally at school as well. Elijah, we got about a minute 30. Final. I got to say this. Uh, don't come out of the closet until you've learned how to dress appropriately while you're in the closet. That's what, that's what it's for, to hold clothes, not look like uh, some half-dressed, grimace-looking McDonald's character from a botched uh, Chinese remake. I mean, you can't decide whether you want to be a man or a woman. You got caterpillar eyebrows so thick that you're going to be harvested for the silk that they might produce. And there's just so much confusion going on there. If I had to bring mental illness and solidify it into a human, that would be it. And I imagine that a schizophrenia, you could meet him in person or them, that is, that is the, someone with many voices in their head and none of them are God. Absolutely. Elijah, thanks for joining me today, man. Where can people follow you and find all your great content? Shows. If you like yourself, stuff. don't follow me. Uh, <laughs> but if you have some, if you're dead inside a little bit like me, and you're watching the world burn, uh, follow Slightly Offensive anywhere you can find podcasts on YouTube and audio only. Make sure you look for it because our names are search banned and is very hard to find. 
slightly offensive, check it out. Absolutely, and here it is, America. We don't exaggerate. The evidence is right before your very eyes. These people want to mutilate the genitals of your children. They want your children. They want to groom your children. They'll facilitate your children coming out. They'll say what they'll call your children, even if you say, don't call my children that. Call them by their biological sex and their God-given names that we gave them as parents. No, no, no. We will do what we want with your children because your children belong to us, mom and dad. They belong to the state. That is the heart of these people. We're not the wrong ones. These people are the psychopaths. My name is Drew Hernandez. These are the front lines, and TPUSA Live starts right now. Authentic, unfiltered, grassroots content and conversation every weekday. Live from Phoenix, Arizona at the Turning Point USA headquarters, this is TP USA Live. Everybody, welcome to TP USA Live. Once again, we're at TP USA HQ in Phoenix, Arizona. Got a lot of good stuff for covering today. I'm scooting in. Hey, Alex Clark is here. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> but hope you, you enjoyed the front lines. What a dynamic duo with, with Elijah Schaefer and Drew Hernandez. Can you hear yeah. me? This is like. This is, this is, this is this live TV. Yes. This is like Trace Atkins. There we go. Ready. This is like real TV. I'm not even you ready. You got five of us today. I'm not even ready. I was still gulping down my Capri Sun. <laughs> that's so on brand, though. Yeah. That's ex And chicken tenders? Were there chicken? Wait, no, chicken nuggets. I think this is on. Am yeah. I on? Yeah, I think sure. You sound right. cool. I mean, they have to tell us. I mean, do we sound good? <laughs> Like, this Rock and roll. Pretty, but we'll fix it later. You look fantastic, Alex, <laughs> and you. you guys look fantastic too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah, you. Exposed leg, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they said I was allowed to be here know. in shorts. Do you shave your legs? I do, but for athletic reasons, not for that life. I feel like mm -hmm. if you're an athlete, you can get away with that as a man. You can, but I'm not even a swimmer. You know, you know how terrible. You know <laughs> how terrible it is it you to have it. like a hamstring injury. It. You get taped up for it, then you have to peel it off with like you know a leg oh. full of man on there. Oh, you know, that's so. fair. I thought maybe it was for speed. It makes you slicker. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wind. That too. You're so I'm aerodynamic. <laughs> yeah, that's what I really thought this whole time. Exactly. The athletes shave their legs. I didn't think about bandages and stuff ripping. I was like, I just really did a lot of math in my head. <laughs> Everything I believe my whole life has been a lie. <laughs> yeah, so what did you guys <laughs> talk about on the couch today? Well, Anthony shaves his legs, and yeah. uh, that was the first five minutes of the segment. So. <laughs> Joe, Joe Bob used to. I don't know why we're not talking hey, about that. Hey, hey, <laughs> fake news. Where is the disinformation police when you need them? Okay, but your haircut. I learned but that your wife cuts she your hair. She does, oh, and she's yeah. not a hairstylist, by the way. So that's the caveat there. Uh, yeah, I think it. I think she does a pretty I good job. I specifically started doing my own nails because of that. I was like, I could save fifty dollars every two weeks yes. for this. Yes. Yes. True Did conservatism. Yes. Yeah. If and you want a real deal, just get the Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah, sorry, the future wife. You are not cutting my hair. <laughs> Unless she's actually a hairstylist. Yeah, yeah well, it cool. took four years to get pretty. There were some mess ups there. Oh, Don't man. get me wrong. So you look like every Forgot third to... grader on picture day. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Saving money. What do you want to talk about today, John? There's a lot to talk about, but we got Paige Rue, Anthony Watson, Joe Bob, Alex Clark, I'm John Root. So we're going to start with this. So there's a national baby formula shortage. So there's some places across the country, we're going to show you photos, where shelves are just empty. And obviously this is just another thing that's going on with the Biden administration. We've had empty shelves with groceries, we've got high gas prices, and while we have empty shelves with baby formula that mothers desperately need, we know that there's about 40% of popular baby formula brands are sold out across the United States in states like South Dakota, Iowa, North Dakota, Missouri, Texas, and Tennessee. They've been hit the hardest, like over 50% of those shelves are empty. Those baby formula brands are gone. But you have Congress that's trying to send billions of dollars over to Ukraine while mothers are in desperate need right now. Makes me absolutely sick. And also, I 
this may be the conspiracy theorist in me, but like, isn't it kind of weird that the left right now is like really promoting all this heavy abortion stuff? Like, look how hard life is. You need to be able to have the right to have an abortion, and now all of a sudden we have a formula shortage. I don't know. That's very conspiracy theorist of me. Huh. But that's fair. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't even think, think about, about that. that. I just, yeah, that's you know, a good. I just because their excuse is going to be like, well, look, at, see, look at our struggles. We can't even get baby formula. We shouldn't bring a baby into this world. I just think it's awfully convenient for this shortage to be happening. Um, but I did ask a bunch of cute conservatives. Look, like we have a lot of mom conservatives in the mm -hmm. cute conservative clan, and so I asked them for advice. And a lot of them were saying that you can actually go to your pediatrician's office, call them up, and say, "Hey, do you guys have a bunch of extra samples of formula? Because formula brands will give pediatricians' office oh. samples samples for their." clients, customers, patients, whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, you can do that if you're really in desperate need, call your pediatrician. Interesting. Reminds yeah. me of my favorite song. I think I remixed it. Well, what'd you do if your kid's at home crying <laughs> all over the bedroom floor because they're he's hungry, hungry and, and the, the only, only way, way to feed him is to harvest your... ballast for a little bit of money. <laughs> <and> like, <laughs> <laughs> who, sung, who sung that? Um, um, who sung that? <sighs> Britney Spears. And you just had Britney Spears. What else you got? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next segment. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Well, well definitely don't great. ask me to sing, but there are reports that illegal immigrants are getting baby formula. Like, there's Congresswoman Kat Kamek shared some of these photos uh, that we're going to show on the screen right now of places like the Ursula Migrant Processing Center Ooh. in McAllen, Texas. Just look at that. That's stocks of it. And then you're gonna see McAllen, Texas, a processing center there. There's just even more. It's just like, don't take. Sure, they can get it. And I feel like every single American should be so pissed off right now that you have an administration that offered hundreds of thousands of dollars to migrants and they're not getting tested for COVID when you couldn't even go to work um, if you weren't vaccinated. And then now, when mothers desperately need baby formula, it's not there, but we're hearing reports that illegal migrants will be getting them. Jeez. I, I, like, and do we know what the holdup is? Because, I mean, it, there are supply chain issues due to a lot of things that aren't actually the administration's fault. But at the same time, I would like for them to at least, like, try and point this stuff out. Because I think uh, President Biden gave a speech on inflation yesterday and not in a single part of it talked about the supply chain issues that we're having. So, like, I, like, I don't know. If you can't blame anybody else, that's who you're going to blame. And I would, I would like them to say something. At least. Well, call me a conspiracy theorist, too, because Bill Gates right now is trying to have, like, synthetic like, baby formula. He's Ooh. trying to start that. So there's reports coming out that they want to reduce the carbon footprint of mothers who choose not to breastfeed. And Biomilk is targeting mean? infant nutrition by attempting to reproduce mother's breast milk in a lab. That sounds And they've sketch. raised $3.5 million like a, in funding so far. It literally just sounds like the vaccine all over again. Yeah. Like what's what's in it? And what's in the it? The makers aren't liable. Dude, so a, a great alternative to breast milk also is goat milk. So for oh, struggling families, go goat milk is very very similar. Tom Brady's to milk. Human <laughs> <breast> <laughs> milk. That was a funny joke. That was very good. <laughs> I have nipples, Greg. Can you milk me? <laughs> <laughs> no, but goat milk is a good alternative. And you know what's really frustrating is that the, the whole slogan of the Biden administration really should be America last. Everyone else, Ukraine, um, illegal immigrants, everyone before, they should go first before American citizens. And that is so disheartening. It's not that, obviously, uh, we want baby illegal immigrant babies to suffer. There's other alternatives. Yeah. But if push comes to shove, American citizens should be, you know, the first priority. And that's so sad. Another piece of news in the daily briefing is, did you guys hear the nickname that President Biden gave former President Trump? It, are you talking about Ultra MAGA or is there a new nickname? Because I haven't heard this. There's a new one. Oh, Let's good. Have to find out right now. <laughs> Check this out. They're dead wrong. Under my predecessor, the great MAGA king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did see this. I saw him on Truth. The, didn't he post a picture on Truth of, He's do got, we have that photo? Yeah, we have oh, that. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> His Truth social post, we're going to throw up on the screen for you right now. It's absolutely hilarious. Like, what do you think of this next <laughs> The great MAGA king is the name Joe Biden is now using to describe me. Thank you, Joe. Make America great again. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Uh, Sounds like a Disney character. Yeah. Like MAGA king. The MAGA you king. Know? Uh, supreme MAGA ruler. They need a side by side of MAGA Hulk oh, and yeah. MAGA King. Oh, that's cute. Mm. And do yeah. a picture. That's what, that would be funny. Too bad MAGA Hulk isn't on the couch today. I know. I would love it.
and know what's so sad is we're going to look back and be like, you know, what was President Biden's shining moment? It's literally going to be that. <laughs> what was his best moment? This. I the nickname that he gave the former leaving. President Trump. <laughs> when that time comes, I was like, there's the shining moment. Goodbye. Did anybody Bye. watch that speech? Because it's clear that uh, mm -hmm. obviously the cognitive decline is there and we all see it and it's pretty evident. But he's also lost the ability to communicate passion effectively. Generally, politicians are pretty good at like conveying passion. You've seen like everybody crying about the whole uh, Roe versus Wade ruling. But instead of like adequately conveying like he's really, really heated about something, he just gets mad and yelly like a really mm -hmm. old guy. Or I, he I, laughs. Yeah, well, it's it's weird. Like, smile. there's 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 obviously the cognitive decline about putting what's actually in his mouth uh, to real words, but just his ability to come off as genuine is just gone at this point. You know what I think is funny is that President Biden is under such severe cognitive decline that even when he tries to insult somebody, he compliments them. Like, Magic <laughs> King is not a mean nickname. Like, that's <laughs> awesome. It's a great nickname. He can't even do that right. Uh, hey, John, you dumb good hair person yeah like, <laughs> gosh i'm gonna tweet about this so i guess joe bob's calling me this great hair person thanks so much joe bob no, yeah, you're gonna make hair twitter? great again what's up are you back on twitter no nah, i'm still oh. off <laughs> <laughs> Dang. i just got so excited not Y'all gonna delete lose. it not gonna do it uh but we're gonna take a quick break talk about the young women's leadership summit we'll give you some discounts codes and then be right back to talk to this 2a baddie about gun rights in america stick around and I hope you're filled with courage and conviction, clarity, and a little bit of wisdom. Know that we at Turning Point USA, we have your back. Welcome back to TPUSA Live. You got a beautiful view of this beautiful office at TPUSA HQ in Phoenix, Arizona. We got Alex, Paige, Anthony, Joe Bob. I'm John. We're going to talk about gun rights in America. Before that, uh, get a little discount code at YWLS, TPUSA.com slash YWLS. Use promo code Poplitics. Poplitics. Or you could use promo code Page. Page. Or you could use promo code. John. That's all we Wow! Did I forget anything? <laughs> wow! <laughs> Here's the thing, Politics already has like the most signups, obviously. Most. I'm but, doing like, pretty good. I don't She's don't doing pretty good. Yeah, you. don't use hers because you know, me and John here need some love. I don't even right? have a cola. Hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> well you're not allowed to come. Pa Oh. I mean, it is uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> only, so I think it makes sense that Paige and I would have more code usage. Did she just assume our gender? I don't know. Oh, so my so, so, so. Fighting words. You guys are okay. You'll be fine. Guys, whoa. <laughs> wow, hey. Wow, okay. okay. What is <laughs> Okay, let's talk about something other than gender. How about guns? <laughs> <laughs> what a great but, day. But it sounds like right now the California gun ban is being lifted on semi-automatic weapons. So yes. there was an appeals court ruled Wednesday that California's ban on the sale of semi-automatic weapons weapons to adults under 21 is unconstitutional and it sounds like no matter what side of the aisle you're on a lot of people are bringing up like yeah this needs to be something that goes along the lines of the constitution you are an adult at 18 so there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to buy a gun there so i guess it was a 2-1 court ruling uh the panel of the san francisco based ninth u.s circuit court on wednesday oh. and i guess i was interested i was just like well how many justices that they usually have yeah um, or judges in there so there's 29 total but there's three selected for specific mm -hmm. for specific <laughs> cases so three got selected here two on ruling what do you think this means for California and, and gun rights you can't just ban crap and it <laughs> work seriously like they something happens and then they're like we have to restrict guns we're gonna restrict guns and we're gonna be the safe I mean same thing as as Illinois they try to do this it's not gonna work um, they did this with the with the high capacity magazine ban as well they deem that unconstitutional mm -hmm. there is a thing called the Constitution that you just can't change it's to your left there Paige there's, huh? there's one right there <laughs> and on today's episode uh, so 
Um, where I'm at, I'm, I'm very grateful that it is. And just to kind of give you some background, because we were talking about this, you actually came to shoot with me, you and your family did. And it's that confusing what, what semi-automatic is and everything like that. So in other states, uh, you can be 18 and purchase a rifle. That's totally fine. That's part of your constitutional right. Now, what they're saying is ages 18 to 21, uh, it was banned. You have to be 21 to purchase basically any firearm in California. They're now lifting that ban. And what's uh, a little bit confusing, a lot of people come to our store, basically you have to be 18 years old to purchase a, a, a rifle and 21 to purchase a handgun. It seems kind of confusing, mm -hmm. right? Like why 21 to purchase a handgun, but but 18 to purchase a rifle. Um, and the reason a lot of, a lot of the reasons was because rifles you can't conceal, mm -hmm. and as well they're used for hunting. And it doesn't make any sense. I think you should be 18 and be able to purchase a handgun or a rifle. That is your constitutional right. Um, so that's where I'm at. I'm very grateful. I hope it actually gets passed into law. Ban is gone, so it's not enforceable now. And I think that's great news. However, the conspiracy theorist in me is going to say that there is going to be some sort of event involving a firearm in California where it's either a rifle or someone from the age of 18 to 20. And then Governor Newsom's going to be like, oh, this is, this is why we can't pass this and we're going to put the ban back on. That's what I'm worried about. Well, that's where they originally put this into effect, though. That was in uh, July 1st of 2021, and there's been other handgun laws that mm -hmm. they've incorporated, you know, after there's a shooting. So it's like, the only way to stop violence is by making sure that law-abiding citizens don't have guns. But it totally is a disregard of actually what's going on here. Because I know we had both of you on when there was that Sacramento shooting. Yes. It's like, whoa, 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 this person shouldn't have been out of jail. Yeah. And it happened in California. Mm -hmm. How yeah. did that happen? Guns are so restricted in California. Mm -hmm. How uh, weird. Right. Yes, my cousin Raekwon, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I, respond to things like that. Yeah, that's I, yeah. <laughs> well, that I can. So <laughs> well, I wonder, so my, my thought is, I, I hope people start to recognize the politicization of this, mm -hmm. right? The only reason this passed is, one, clearly, clearly it's unconstitutional, and everybody knows it. Governor King, dictator Gavin Newsom, knows that it's against the Constitution. Not MAGA quit, King. Different, not MAGA King. Different King. King. No, different King. Governor King, dictator, tyrant Gavin Newsom. Uh, knows that there was no way this was gonna hold, but he's doing it specifically because he wants to be the president. So he's oh, virtue yikes. signaling from the state of California these unconstitutional laws that'll eventually get overturned so that when he runs for president, he gets to go, I tried to ban the guns and the evil, evil conservatives stopped me. That's all this is, and I really wish people would recognize the politics at play here. It, it absolutely is, and what's so, I mean, facts are facts, and the states that have the the least restrictive laws when it comes to firearms are have the least amount of crime states like california there's crime all the time people don't feel safe people are being told that if someone enters your home you can't do anything about that how does that make any sense you need to protect yourself you have the right to stand where you're at and states like arizona or texas and a lot of other other pro 2a states are are where criminals don't want to commit crime because why? Because it's very likely that someone, a law-abiding citizen in your area is going to have a firearm and train to defend themselves. That is our absolutely constitutional right. This is our country and this is my life and I deserve to protect that life rather than that, that criminal that was released out of jail or not being <laughs> prosecuted. Why is their life more important than mine? Totally. Do you, did you guys remember, or did you see this tweet from Mayor Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of very, very anti-gun California? Oh, the human Chicago. roach. Chicago. I'm yeah, nervous. Sh sorry, yes. Chicago. What did I say? California. Yeah, sorry, Chicago. Chi uh, the, <laughs> tomato, tomato, she, Chicago, <laughs> California. <laughs> Same thing, effectively. Uh, but Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago said that the Supreme Court... Uh, trying to, quote unquote, attack the LGBT community. This moment is a call to arms. Oh, Insurrection! I heard that! Did, but, you, remember, did you see but that? But they don't like guns. Yeah, you banned all the Wait arms. a second, wait a second. Lightfoot? I got a firearm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this handgun. I don't know about that. <laughs> but it's, just, it's comical at this point. So now it's okay to take up arms in the city that ban all the arms? Get out of here. Yeah, you know the, who the has the arms? The criminals correct. out there. The, the criminals? No, no, no those, that's illegal, John. 
No, well, like, and the she's criminals also, have. She's also <clears throat> called on on uh, ATF and on the federal side mm -hmm. to come to Chicago to help with the crime <laughs> issue. Can you can you come and help us? I'm like, why don't you stop defunding the police and you actually That's start? Insane. I know. And lifting and allowing your citizens to mm -hmm. arm themselves because yeah, you do have a criminal issue because they know they What's have the, the power in Chicago. In her mind, what is the difference between the federal police, you know, <laughs> someone like the FBI or ATF or whatever, um, and local police? Why That's is she? Question. Why is one demonized to her and not the other? I, I mean, none of that makes sense at all. No, hmm. right? it actually doesn't make no, sense. No, it doesn't. Well, make the FBI is busy right now going after parents too, so I don't know if they're gonna be able to find it. I think you mean terrorists, John. <laughs> parents. The Excuse attorney me. general called them domestic terrorists. Jeez. Jeez. Garland. <laughs> Way to go, Not buddy. call any of the actual terrorists coming across the border terrorists, but parents, those are terrorists. Yeah. Like, could you give us a breakdown of semi-automatic weapon and what that means? Because a lot of people, you hear semi-automatic, and then everyone's going to say, well, that's got to be an assault weapon, right? And that's yes. another way the left uses these terms and manipulates people. The, they do use these terms to manipulate, and it's so sad because even I felt manipulated until I really started digging, and I said, oh my gosh, this doesn't make sense. Um, I go over it a lot on my show Reloaded, um, but Basically, they use the term assault weapon. Assault weapon sounds scary. Now, what's up? Oh, I'm just like, the <laughs> only reason I have a weapon for protection is to assault you if you try to assault me. So, so get, get this, <laughs> get this. So basically they're, they're combining two different terms and creating one in order to play you and manipulate you to ban a completely different object. Mm -hmm. So bear with me. Assault rifle is a fully automatic firearm. You actually, it, it's, a, it's a rifle, it looks like an AR-15, and an AR-15 stands for Armalite rifle, not assault <laughs> rifle, okay? What? Bear, bear with me. So. And then the only people that can get those assault rifles. You need, you need a lot of licensing. None of us can go and say, Hi, my name is John Root, and I would like a full auto or an assault rifle. You can't do that and just Take leave. Take a hike, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> you need a lot of licensing. Um, a lot of them are manufacturers or police departments who have assault rifles, or the military. The military also uses the term assault rifle for weapon. They they talk about uh, handguns, whatever their weapons are. It could be a knife, whatever they use. That is their weapon, that is the term. As a civilian, we don't use that term. It's a tool or it's our firearm. We don't use the term weapon. But the left, what they like to do is combine this fully automatic assault rifle with weapon and make an assault weapon, because how scary does that sound for someone who does not know yeah. what these terms mean? And they're using assault weapon to ban semi-automatic firearms that any of us can walk into a store and purchase if we're a law-abiding citizen. Hmm. They're using this full auto assault crazy term in order to ban something that we have absolutely the right to do so. And now, apparently in California, you can be 18 and legally purchase. So that is what is so manipulative, uh, manipulative and and crazy and confusing about these laws because even I mean I know Alex like you always are like I have no idea what questions to ask about guns and even those three terms are so confusing and they're just trying to manipulate. Well, yeah. I have an honest question because I don't know much about this argument, but what do you say to people that use that term military grade? Because I don't oh, are they still using that's that? That's a good question. You know, because I, I hear that all the time as someone that supports people like yourself that use firearms, and they're just like, you support people that have military-grade weapons. I'm like, and I wish Paige was here. <laughs> <laughs> and phone a friend. Yeah. Um, I actually don't hear that term very often, but I'm also in the industry where people are supportive of firearms, and we use different But from my hood, firms. everything is military-grade. Milita <laughs> military-grade. And they're probably thinking of everything that they see online where it's it's assault weapons and and assault rifles and those terms. So I'd maybe just say, no, military grade is actually completely different than civilian and we're, every time that you pull the trigger, it fires once. And law-abiding citizens can have firearms like that. In my opinion, we should have, be able to own any firearm, but that's a different topic. <laughs> um, but they, they use that, I think, because it's one of those, they're driven by the left of military grade. It's all scary, it's all military, it's all, it's all negative. Where firearms are used to save, I mean, 60,000 to 2.5 million lives a year. And mm -hmm. we've talked about this on live.
I love seeing people that are like terrified of guns and then they're around guns and they learn about them and they respect them. I just had my whole family oh my God, go so and, and shoot with Paige. It's great because my sister-in-law is from Australia. Oh yeah. She had never seen a gun. I was handling it and I could see her eyes and I paused and she's like, this is actually the first time I've ever seen a gun in person. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so, I would have eased you into this. Yeah. I'm like, this is a magazine and you rack it and stuff like that. <laughs> like, you should, like you should have saw my sister-in-law's face. She's just like, Oh, I'm sure she was just mind blown. It was crazy. And then like she's learning how to, you know, load the gun and then everything. And then, you know, she wasn't even sure if she wanted to participate in this whole thing. And then we go to the shooting range. She's shooting every single gun down the line. And then she <laughs> shot, she shot a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's liberating. I'm, I'm a good instructor. It was very controlled. It wasn't like that. <laughs> That'd be me if I was having a gun. It's just, that is a spot. Oh, <laughs> good on you, Mike. She did amazing, though. She was so safe. She she had great control over it. And she's like, can I try that one? Can I try that one? <laughs> and I was like, hey, we've got about 10 rounds left. Who wants it? And she goes, I will. She didn't even give any of you a chance. Yeah. She did such a good job. And then now she wants to get one. Yeah, she wants good. to get one. She wants to practice more. That's what's yeah. so crazy. She wants to get a membership. She wants to take lessons more. She wants to learn about this tool. We're not these like crazy people who are blah doing that. You know, we're we're controlled and hopefully. So the black guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when can I take tarot gun lessons from you? <laughs> right. I was. Um, but we, you know, you learn and you learn about this tool that you're going to use. You can use it as defense, but it's also a sport that we have to remember. It's a sport that you're able to do as well. Hmm. It's fun. I love it. Yeah. I can't wait to go back. It's a lot of fun. Good work, Marty. Shout out to you. But we're going to be right back uh, talking about the delinquent Biden administration and how the Senate absolutely failed to pass their abortion bill. We'll be right back. Yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. Abortion, I salute you! Women, if you need an abortion, get one! And you said ban is decent! Decent! Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to the next generation. Activate freedom. Join Patriot Mobile. Welcome back to TVUSA Live. Once again, we're at TVUSA headquarters in Phoenix, Arizona. Joe, Bob, Anthony, Alex. I'm John. Uh, we're going to talk about the Biden administration's new Now failure. you sound like Biden. We I got know, to talk about the Biden administration. So, how do you say it? Uh, <laughs> America can be described in one word. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that clip? Do you remember that clip? Like yeah. last week or something like that? Oh, this is a, uh, it's scary and hilarious. <laughs> it really is. But uh, something that's, uh, we try to give you some good news. I know there's a lot of bad news constantly in this world right now, but the Senate failed to pass their abortion bill, which mm -hmm. is basically just would have allowed anybody at any time to abort their baby, aka murder a child. So they attempted to pass the Women's Health Protection Act of 2022. So the motion failed 49 to 51. Mm -hmm. And you gotta remember there's 50 leftists there. Yep. There's only one on the left that Joe voted Manchin. against this and Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Oh man. So, sorry, like to get into the weeds of this, did you guys hear what he said before they actually went to the vote? Is that like, so, so what Joe Manchin, or Senator Joe Manchin did was describe what the actual bill was. He said, this is not a codification of Roe versus Wade. I'm sure everybody's heard that term. This, the codification of Roe versus Wade. We're trying to preserve Roe versus Wade. Senator Joe Manchin came out before the vote took place and said, this is not that. This is the expansion of abortion. It's going to knock down 500 state laws. He said himself, I would have voted for a quote unquote codification of Roe versus Wade. But since this is not that, I'm not voting for it. That's the reason he didn't vote for it, because they, instead of actually trying to maintain Roe versus Wade, they tried to expand it and they make a much more expansive federal government uh, policy over the states. Because people have to remember too, like with Roe v. Wade, they think it's like, oh, abortion is just all over. It's yeah. like, no, it should be up to 
the states, and it sounds like Senator Joe Manchin is like, yeah, I am totally with the states being able to decide for themselves. Yeah, so what's important, I think, to understand the left wanted to pass this week is they wanted zero restrictions, abortion through all nine months. Mm -hmm. This is the modern day left's view on abortion. They used to promote and talk about how it's just, you know, um, only in certain circumstances, uh, in dangerous situations, whatever. No, they want no holds barred for any reason whatsoever. I mean, the baby could be crowning and they think you should be allowed to dismember it. So that is very important because when you poll Americans, they like to always say, well, well the majority of Americans support yeah. Roe v. Wade. They do they say yes oh well i would consider myself pro-choice but then when you ask them a little bit more and you ask some follow-up questions the overwhelming majority of americans only really support abortion if they're going to consider themselves pro-choice in the first trimester they do believe in restrictions and they definitely do not believe in abortion through all nine months so what you have is the modern day left taking a completely <laughs> radical um, approach to this topic they're not trying to dance around it anymore they're saying yes absolutely your baby could be halfway out and we still think you should be allowed to kill it not only that but we know that on multiple occasions they've now denied the ability to save that baby after it's born if it fails the abortion well, and they also would call that health care, which is absolutely yeah. insanity to me. Murdering is not health care. Well, the other thing, so not to even get even more cynical on that point, is I don't actually think that was their intent at all. If their intent was actually to codify Roe versus Wade, they would have put a more moderate bill through that J Senator Joe Manchin would have voted for. <coughs> and there, were, there was even some talk of possibly some conservatives voting for it, too, just because it was a uh, there's a timestamp on it. But instead, you're right, they went radical to the lefty side specifically for political reasons because they knew that it wasn't going to pass and they could get a bunch of conservative senators on the record in for the midterms in November uh, to try and get them uh, booted out of office. Yeah, That's what it is. Like it, it, Again, a more cynical approach is that they never wanted this thing to actually go through. That's why they put this radical bill through. And Senator Joe Manchin was just like, uh, this is not what I signed up for at all. He's never claimed, he's said it many, many times, he's like, I'm not a liberal. They did not elect a liberal. They elected a union Democrat in West Virginia, which, by the way, President Trump won by a lot. Uh, and so he doesn't want to lose that seat either. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I'll, I'll stop rambling. Oh, that was good. I, you can't get cynical enough about politicians. Seriously. Yeah. I think uh, Congman Lee, good friend of ours, TV USA ambassador, broke this down in such a great way that if you were a Christian and you vote for the left, <clears throat> this is who you're voting for. You're voting yeah. for people that think at any time you can murder kids, and that does not go along with your faith at all. So I don't. Every single one of them voted for this absolute except for, no. Except for Senator Manchin. That's, that's it. it. All of them but one. And, and you have to understand that if one of these leftist politicians um, decides to go against that narrative, they completely excommunicate them out. Think of somebody like Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. okay? So they shunned her completely. She yeah. was out because she was one person on the left who did say like, well, I, I am pro-choice, but I do at least believe, you know, only up to a certain point. Yeah. I do believe in some restrictions. They said, no, nope, you're not one of us. So they have openly and uh, taken a total right radical position. So if you even believe that there should be some restrictions, then you have to know going into the midterms that the conservative way to vote is the only way you can vote because the left wants zero restrictions. Well, the thing too is they're, they're banking on the fact, they're betting on the fact that nobody's going to look into that actual bill. Because like you said, it's insanely radical, but they get to say, well, these senators voted against the Roe versus Wade codification. And so what that tells you is that all of the tears that you saw from Vice President Kamala Harris, from Senator Elizabeth Warren, from all of these super lefty politicians were entirely fake. The entire thing was fake because they knew it wasn't going to pass to begin with, and they did that on purpose to get people on the record for political reasons. But people, sorry, John. No, you're good, you're good. But people have to understand, they're like, well, if the majority of Americans do believe in some restrictions when it comes to abortion, they don't fully support yeah. abortion through all nine months, then why would all of these politicians, why would all of these leftists say that they're going to embrace that? It is because 
organizations like Planned Parenthood fund these politicians yeah. Yeah. more than anyone else. So they have to take these radical ideas that in turn make Planned Parenthood money because they're allowed to do abortions now, <laughs> not restricted. Till the baby is coming out. Yeah. So that's why they take these positions. It's because they're making money and then Planned Parenthood makes money and it's a whole circle. Well, uh, sorry, one, la one last thing that mm. I feel like Senator Joe Manchin said that I think was super, super important when he was talking about this. He was saying that all of the political division that goes on comes from within the houses of legislation. The American people are telling us what they want and what they want is very unified yep. and they're saying exactly what they want. Uh, all of the division is coming from inside the institutions. So he's right in that. All of the divide that we have is because these radical people are in actual office and voting on radical bills instead of what the American people actually want. And the American people need to look into this stuff too because you hear just a, yeah. a headline that just says that you know every single person on the right voted against this abortion bill. So obviously they're against women <laughs> and like that's all they're gonna see. But what is yeah, a you woman? And, men can, give, right. and right. men can give birth. So who's, sh shut so up, stop crying. Here's the thing, and you are absolutely right, is that now in the month of May, everything is about a woman's right. And then as soon as it's June 1st, everything is gonna be back to anyone is a woman who <laughs> identifies as a woman, we're all gender amoebas. Like, that's <laughs> all gonna change. That is your new hit theme song. Gender, gender amoebas. Gender amoeba. Gender amoeba. Gender amoeba. Gender amoeba. Gender amoeba. Gender amoeba. But they will, they will <laughs> abandon this issue, then it will be Pride Month, so then it will be back to anyone can be a woman. How do you, I, I just. Alex, you can change your pronouns month by month. That's the, what they're the telling people. The main thing is, Come on. is that people have to understand that, well, I, I should say pro-choice people need to understand that you know one of the main couple hangups that pro people that claim to be pro choice have is that they do support, um, like I said, they do support, um, I'm forgetting my word. They, restrictions. Yeah. Yes. Pro lifers. I won't be able to help to, out today. I can't speak myself. <laughs> Sorry. Pro, pro lifers need to understand that even though people that claim to be pro choice do support restrictions uh, overwhelmingly, they always have this um, in the, their mind, they always have this. Uh, thing with, you know, rape, incest, and when the life like of the mother is There's like stipulations there, which yes. like, yeah, I, the vast majority yes. I don't like, but like, what about That's why they say they're pro-choice. Yeah. And so as pro-lifers, we have to do a really good job in our messaging of a couple things. One, explaining that there is no medical instance where you have to purposefully take that innocent life in order to save the life of a mother. If you're talking yes. about abortion is health care, mm -hmm. in a healthcare setting, if people are in danger, you do your best to save both. If that means having to deliver that baby early, tragically, and it passes away, you still did your best, and then you do your best to save the mom, but you don't have to intentionally kill that child in order for mom to survive. She just might have to deliver, and that baby might pass away. Um, and then, you know, with rape and incest, there's stuff that you can talk about that too. Um, and then also understanding that so many women have had abortions, and the reason that they claim to be pro-life, or I'm sorry, the reason that they are claiming to be pro-choice is because they themselves have had an abortion, and so if they have to admit yeah. that it, abortion is wrong, then what are they saying about themselves? Yeah. And it's a, it's a guilt thing. They're dealing with that, and so these mothers, as much as we care for innocent life in the, in the womb, we have to do good with our messaging, talking about we care about both, we love them both, we care about the mom, and we care about the baby, and that is what will change people's minds. And People's minds can get changed. I know I've talked yeah. to a lot of people and I've spent way too much time through Instagram DMs <laughs> having conversations, but I had somebody send me, I think it's for parent.org or .com, and they were going along the lines of, you know, what if a mother's life is at risk? The article literally said something that could put a mother's life at risk is if the baby could potentially be Down syndrome. And I was like, you are, you're really gonna send me this. Huh. I Say thought the that only thing that really threatens a mother is just breech birthing. The baby comes out feet first. No. Correct me if, I know like, there are more, but. I mean, that is dangerous, but when you're talking about the topic of abortion, usually they're talking about ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic, yeah. Um, and all these different things. And also, you know, of course, right now, the pro-choice side is saying how Roe v. Wade cannot be overturned because then you have all these back alley abortions, this whole narrative yeah. of, of women will be doing abortions on their own. But during the pandemic, 
we saw Planned Parenthood and, and the abortion lobby promoting at-home oh, abortions. Oh, that's a good point. So, yes, and, and Ali Stuckey talked about this on her podcast, so, I, so this really got into my mind this week because of Ali Stuckey, but that's what's been going on, is they're now changing their narrative. They want you to, hey, the abortion pill, take it at home, and by the way, if you have no medical professional around you when you're doing the abortion pill, things can go wrong, um, and, you know, it is, uh, it's very unsafe to do that at home, but then they're saying now, well, we have to have Roe v. Wade, where women will be doing abortions at home or in back alleys. <laughs> like, well, pick your side. They always move the goalposts. This is what the left does with every single issue, whether whether it's gun rights, whether it's abortion, whether it's the LGBTQ stuff. It changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Hmm. And it's funny when you compare that to guns. We just had a conversation about guns. Like, well, if you just take it away, just like, you know, people are just going to go and... <laughs> they won't have them anymore. Do, yeah, and, and then, mm. you know, <laughs> gun owners and law-abiding citizens are like, Come on. <laughs> this is literally along the same lines here. But another piece of um, failure from the Biden administration was they are cutting domestic oil from Alaska. So that got announced that they're canceling oil and gas lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska's Cook Inlet. So this is canceling over a million plus acres of oil land in Alaska. And then this is they right now. Russia. Oh, but no, that's where we need to get our oil. It's Anthony? Like, oh, yeah, but yeah, the Alaska, yeah, Putin. See, we bought it from Russia, so we might as well just cancel it, you know, and now just take <laughs> everything away. But what else is to be expected? Keystone, Colonial, now Alaskan. What other pipelines do we have here? <laughs> well, they've, can't, they've canceled them all. Oh, and then right like, now when we have just the highest gas prices. in your pipeline, snatching your gas prices up, <laughs> trying to... Snatching your people up. Hydro cars, hydro cars, hydro cars. cars hydro <laughs> But that's another thing where it's, what's going to help get gas prices down? Obviously, if we have energy independence and we use our domestic oil, that's exactly what was going on with the Trump administration. And then now here, it's just like, well, if we're not going to do it here, we have to have a dependence on foreign countries. And if that doesn't tell you anything, I don't know what does. No, no, no. I'd rather buy our oil from a super, super fun dictatorship like Venezuela. <laughs> that's what we should I'm do. They, they eat zoo animals. It's fun. Ay, ay, ay. It's going, things are going so well down there, so we might as well, yeah. Ugh. Well, you know what is fun? The Student what? Action Summit. Yeah. And if you're a meme lord, if you want to find uh, the love of your life, <laughs> Benny Johnson says you will find it at SAS. Many That's people some, have. I've been at SAS guarantee. for almost for three years now, man. Struck out every single time. Oh. Hmm. Four well, times the charm. Four times the charm. There. Hey, Anthony's going to find love. And hopefully <laughs> you, do, you do too. We're going to give you a discount code, and then we'll be right back talking about the school board watch list. Calling all based patriots, meme lords, and cute conservatives, Student Action Summit is happening 2022, Tampa, Florida, July 22nd through the 24th. You don't want to miss it. You'll make lifelong friends, you'll probably meet your soulmate, and you'll be able to network with the biggest names in the conservative movement. Sign up now at tpusa.com. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. Welcome back to TPUSA HQ in Phoenix, Arizona. We've got Anthony Watson. We've <laughs> got Joe Bob, Alex Clark. I'm John Root. If you want to get tickets to the Student Action Summit, you can go to tpusa.com slash SAS, and you can use discount code Joe Bob. That's it. Yes. The only discount code you can, you can yes. use. That, that's yes. Is it's, that true? You know why? And I watch nobody show it's, up. Because it's my month. It's, it's AP... Uh, what, are the, what do oh, it's, it's my month that I don't know. No, no, Pacific what do, what do, Islanders what do, API. What do white intellectual liberals call me or tell me I am? Asian Pacific Islander. Asian, 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 Asian Pacific Islander. No, but there's two more letters now. Oh, there is? Like, Good it's like God. Desi American, which, uh, what the heck what is, is that? that? I don't know. Anyways, it's my month, so use my promo code. <laughs> now nobody's going to show up. Is your, <laughs> is your people starting to be like the alphabet mafia? Like you just got to start adding letters I think we just symbols? start adding all the letters. So the A-P-I-D-S-Q-Y-L-2 plus spirit. Well, I, went, I went from being black to a P-O-C. What is, you, oh, you two yeah. are just racist. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess that makes me an SOB. Well, that's why they separated me. <laughs> <laughs> Another quality joke from John Root today. Thank that's you. Yes, sir. <laughs> substantially I might not be able to talk straight half the show, but man, I got a couple good oh, jokes. You got a couple <laughs> big bad jokes on lock. All right, so let's talk about the school board watch list. If you want some more information about these school boards that we're going to tell you about, you can go to schoolboardwatchlist.org. 
Obviously, we're doing whatever we can here at Turning Point <coughs> USA to make sure that we fight back against these leftist school boards that are trying to indoctrinate children, like at Linmar Community School District in Marion, Iowa. So in Iowa there, that district has 10 total schools and nearly 8,000 students enrolled. So they mandated masks for the entirety of the 2021-2022 school year. They, the mandate forces students, staff, and visitors to wear a mask at all times when inside school buildings and regardless of vaccination status. But this is when it starts getting into the weeds of everything. So they have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, of course just like we've heard a lot of school boards push right now. And as of October, 2021, they have a diversity committee and the themes were developed for use in this assessment survey. So here's what they were talking about. Some of the themes included increasing allies and support system across the district, celebrating the beliefs and values of the district in regards to diversity and equity and investigating restorative discipline. What's and that? What is the restorative discipline? Oh, no, I know what this is. Yeah. They're trying to make this a federal thing of where, like, you don't, nobody gets punished for anything. Like, if some kid hits another kid on the playground, they bring both kids in the room, they make them hug, and nothing happens to either one of them. Well, obviously, it wouldn't happen to the kid who got hit, but the kid who hit the other kid, nothing happens to him. Restorative justice or something yep. like that. They're trying to make that a federal thing, too. We, we just, did an event last week in California, you mm -hmm. and I together. What the heck was that thing, member, that the students pointed Dude, out on the wall? I don't know. There was we like were doing this... an event, and this one uh, Asian girl, she was just like, we have to take diversity training, and we sit in classrooms, and yeah. she's like, there's a long list of things of how to be equal and diverse, like, right, and we were like, whoa. Well, do they have, like, there's like an equity pyramid now. Yeah, I think it, we, that was like what it was in the it classroom. It was, just in like, it was like a Box list. Form. Sorry, oh. I just did the Illuminati here. Well, mm -hmm. it wasn't it's it wasn't touching, so it doesn't count. <laughs> can, can, <laughs> can I tell a Funny story about the professor watch list. Absolutely. So I not. was up at I was up doing a <laughs> uh, an event with with Charlie at Berkeley of all places, and Charlie was doing his like table talk thing, and I was like incognito talking to people <laughs> and getting some reactions, not as a TPUSA person. And there was this guy with this megaphone who was yelling for an impressive amount of time. Honestly, he, just, he hates Charlie. He hates Turning Point. He hates everybody involved. But at one point, he was like. Charlie Kirk and Turning Point are trying to establish a professor's watch list where they expose what's going on in the classrooms. And I was like, yeah, correct. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. There are no arguments here. I agree with you on that point. Is this some sort of criticism? Pass I'm not go, entirely collect sure. $200. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> you're right on that, sir. But anyways, it's funny how uh, the different vantage points of, uh, this is bad. I was like, okay, wait. They're on. calling out wrongdoing. Yeah. Why does the left hate w if we expose the stuff that goes on behind yeah. closed doors in classrooms, but they love yeah. to dig through, you know, our Twitter feed from 2009 and show our employees Employer, things that we tweeted or you know any and I say we I just mean people yeah, yeah like why are they okay with certain things digging things up and exposing it to the public but not that dude I don't know well and then when you're going along the lines of like this is actually like just implementing these policies uh -huh. so this document that I was just talking about from this April 2022 meeting, it says that students who identify as transgender participate in whatever sport they choose, enter any bathroom of the gender they identify with, and forces administrators, administrators to withhold the gender identity of students from their parents. So this declares that a student has the right to keep their trans status a secret. And any disclosure, they're going to threaten that of a student's gender identity to a parent or guardian is forbidden and may violate federal law. You gotta cut t family ties. It's way easier for the government con to control you. Yeah. Is there a trans age thing yet? Like, am I allowed to be trans age? Because at some point, I'm gonna go back and win a high school girls national championship uh, <laughs> as a track star, if, if that's a thing. But I don't know. Probably will be soon. Give it a couple weeks. <laughs> That would be interesting. Yeah, actually. yeah. I'm waiting for them to give uh, issue a uh, apology to Rachel Dole is all, you know, the white woman who pretended yeah. to be black, and that was a huge sensational story. Yeah. Like, you know, when are they gonna say like, actually, we were wrong? Yeah, That's you fine. can be this. Yeah, huh. I'm waiting for that. Was that the female Tropic Thunder? What was that? <laughs> Rachel Dole. Essentially, Dola. yeah. Wow. That's exactly what it was. You don't <laughs> remember that story? What was you the girl mean, that pretended people? to be for that black organization? She was like the NAACP. president. NAACP. Yeah, she yes. was the president of yeah. NCAA. Oh, with her yeah, green yeah, yeah. eyes and curly hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was literally a pale blonde girl yeah. growing up. What do you mean, you people? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but I guess now students will have access to the restroom or their gender, like I said, and identity than rather than the gender they were uh, gender they were born as. And so this is what they had to say with respect to restrooms, locker rooms, and or changing facilities. Students shall have access to facilities that correspond to their gender identity. And once again, all this is doing is screwing up kids. Like psychologically? Well, for a lot of these girls that are in middle schools, for example, that have uh, have been told by their school board that they have to share their bathrooms and locker rooms with boys, that's the first time a lot of them have seen um, a boy naked before. And that's really yeah. jarring Tra for them and traumatizing. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. And that's just not what's supposed to be going on. Yeah. But. Anytime you hear something like this, you got to stand up. So we actually had a TPUSA chapter stand up against this, and we got some footage of that. So that was captured by TPUSA regional manager Jordan Landau. Let's check it out. That's the first time I've ever danced to that chant. Hey, hey, oh, oh. Okay, I'm down with it. <laughs> you, love, you love to see it, though, because I know we got some photos of, of this as well. And anytime you see something like this, sure, you can talk about it. We're here at TPUSA Live to expose the school boards that obviously are up to nonsense. Uh, and there's a few of them that just voted no. There's, uh, there's Matt and then Barry right there, because there was a 5-2 vote during this full capacity school board meeting talking about some of these policy changes. But people are making sure their voices are heard, and this is exactly why people need to run for school board yeah. right now. And that's why I love that, you know, Charlie's on the front lines with a lot of this stuff. We just talked about the Scottsdale school board. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us went out there to make sure we support the people that actually want to make sure there is good education going on, not just indoctrination and then putting girls and young boys in these tough situations and ruining them psychologically. Totally. And I feel like that you, you hit on a good point. I feel like a lot of people care so much about federal government and who the president is. There's real power at the local level. Like the school boards and your city councils, even your like your county supervisors or whatever they're called when in whatever area you live in, they have some real power. So yeah, I, I appreciate people that are uh, that are patriots stepping up and running for school board seats. Uh, even though it doesn't sound super sexy, it's very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> and then something I know we covered uh, a few weeks ago, I think, uh, so the LA Unified School District, just in case you forgot, they have an enrollment of almost half a million kids. Jeez. And it's the largest singular school district in the country. And take a wild guess what their budget is, Joe Bob. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know. I feel like it's going to make me cry. With their a budget? slogan like that? A logo yeah, like that's that, the they logo. gotta be pushing yeah. <laughs> seven digits. <laughs> or four dollars. Uh, that's a four dollar logo right there. I like that. Jeez, man. So for the 2021-22 school year, their budget was 7.59 billion. Jeez. Yeah, that's I was telling you, it's in that uh, 10 figure. Uh, Billions? <laughs> that's, Billions. That's so, a lot. It's a lot. With a B. I mean, could have bought Twitter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tweeted something yesterday that got people kind of upset, I think. It said, you're closer to being a millionaire than Elon Musk oh, is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's not at all related to this, but oh, that hurts to hear. But our update on this story was uh, they have information and they're offering resources when it comes to abortion for teenagers. And so according to Breitbart.com, their website here for the L.A. School District is explaining that under California law, teens are not required to ask their parent or guardian for permission for an abortion. So once again, too, uh, we don't want to co-parent with the government. And we have school boards, though, that are telling you, don't go to your parents. We Jeez. got you. And you talk about grooming. That's just specifically manipulating kids to trust them and say, you know, we got your best interest in mind. You want to get an abortion. You want to change your gender identity, anything like that. That's just totally up to you. And then Newsmax was stating, too, the L.A. District also partnered with Planned Parenthood for teens since 2019. Mm. I know you were mentioning some of that 
where it's still, where's Planned Parenthood start getting into schools a little bit? They're already there in places like the LA Unified School District. Dude, what I don't understand about the left's philosophy here is all of the crazy stuff going into schools is only hurting the kids that can't afford to go to private school. Every person that I know that can afford it or has the ability to do it is taking their kid out of government schools. Mm -hmm. And so all of this crazy stuff is going to specifically hurt all of the people that lefties claim to be so such advocates for. I, I, I don't understand the, the, the rationale behind that. Because there is none. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> it's because it, it doesn't exist. That's why you can't figure it out. Well, I know you talk about this all the time, like how a lot of this whole trans movement and abortion and everything has become a trendy topic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for these kids. So it's almost just like you are a part of a specific group if you get an abortion. That might be something that you can talk about on TikTok or you trans or something like that. Well, that's and, true. That's a really good point. I, I also think, hey, if your school is able to take you to go get an abortion and hide it from your parents, um, any predators that are working in that school that impregnates oh, a child dang. can easily hide their evidence. Uh, you also have, talking about Planned Parenthood being involved in the school board since 2019, Planned Parenthood teaches sex ed in all these schools. They're mm -hmm. who, who is who is providing the curriculums to teach sex ed. That's why these kids are so misinformed on the topic of abortion. And they use terminology like, um, you know, removing the tissue when you're talking about removing the baby. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when they talk about sucking out the brains of a child, they don't say the word brain, they say the gray matter. All of this verbiage, everything, are in, is used to indoctrinate children from a young age to think that abortion isn't scary, it's very quick and easy, and that it isn't actually the act of murdering a human being. Did you see President Biden when he was talking about this and he slipped up? He didn't use the terminology by that everybody uses. He said abort a child yeah. and people like freaked out because well, he, he, well, he said the true he, thing yeah, out loud and they, yeah. they couldn't refute it. And so every, for people who don't know that they never use the word child. They use clump of cells or fetus or something like that. And President Biden slipped up and uh, paid the price for it on the lefty side. Oh yeah. I'm by speaking good. what's true, by the way, but. He can't put sentences together, and neither can I. So I have a, a little bit of sympathy for him. But if you want some more information about some of those school districts, I know there's a few things we weren't able to cover with the LA Unified School District, like uh, Project U that they have going on. Get in for more information at schoolboardwatchlist.org, and we're going to be right back for one last thing. All right, guys, you have signed up, right? You've joined freedomsquare.com. If you haven't, why not? This should have happened a decade ago. How did somebody not think of this earlier? If you're a business owner, we have a business directory to promote your business to patriots across the nation. So if you want to buy American, if you want to sell American, we have a business directory. Whatever it is, go now. Join us in the fight for freedom. Welcome to Freedom Square. So we got school districts too. We're going to keep talking about that. There's one California school district that is asking kids, you know, how often do you hang out with kids of a different, different gender identity? Uh, you got to fill a certain quota, basically. But we what? got Anthony, Joe, Bob, Alex Clark. I'm John Root. Here's some of <laughs> are most kids saying, I don't know what the heck that means. <laughs> Probably like because as a kid, I would be like. What? what are I you talking about? It's out of their control. Like, okay, for example, where I grew up, I grew up in a very rural suburb um, in southern Indiana. And I mean, I can count on one hand how many kids of color were in my grade, but that's just like where we were living. It just happened to be that way. If you live in an inner city area, obviously you're gonna have a lot more people of color going to your school, but it's like, how in the world is a kid gonna control that where they, their parents end up moving and where they're living? So this is what the Poway uh, district is saying oh, when they're Poway. Poway. Oh, geez, right down the street. So this is uh, grades six to twelve, mm -hmm. and so this survey had thirty-one questions, probing students, asking them how they're relating to equity, whether they felt equipped to speak against racism and homophobia. Here's some of the questions uh, they were they were asked. Here's the first one: How fairly do students at your school treat people from different gender identities, races, ethnicities, or cultures? Another one, how often do students learn about, discuss, and confront issues of race, ethnicity, and culture in school? How often do teachers encourage you to learn about people from different gender identities, races, ethnicities, or cultures? How often do you think about what someone of a different gender identity, race, ethnicity, or culture experiences? And finally, how confident are you that students at your school can have honest conversations with each other 
about race. Who cares? What's the age range for this? Yeah, what, what are they? Grade six, six to twelve. Oh, because I'm like, huh? Who <laughs> freaking cares? Like when I was that age, like I I liked certain people and I didn't like certain people. I like wasn't aware of the whole race thing. But like, this is so like this is the only thing that anyone talks about, you know, in media, in Hollywood, on uh, on social media, and in in the schools. So these questions, like, how often are you learning about other cultures and talking about race and hearing about gender identities? I'm like. 100% of the time, I'm always hearing <laughs> this. So these kids, when they're answering this, like they're gonna say, yes, we're constantly talking about race, we're constantly talking about other cultures and genders or whatever, because this is all they do talk about. So I don't understand how this this survey that they're trying to, to give to these kids, how it's gonna, you know, what it's gonna show them. Well, it's yeah. basically just showing these kids, like, well, how much are you serving these communities? Like, are you actually going out of your way to protect these people? Are you actually an ally for these people? And then they're supposed to make these kids feel bad. That's exactly what they're doing here. It's just like, they're inundated. Like, when you go home from school, you got all these commercials about all these gender identity stuff. You're inserting into math, science, reading everything. It's a part of their life, but they want these kids to feel bad, and especially the white kids. I have changed my opinion. I think all of you should feel bad for not bringing me a personal gift on APIDS month, which is my <laughs> month. When you learn how to actually say the acronym, I will I get you I think that's what it gift. is. I think it's APIDSQ4629 plus three. <laughs> but we will talk about someone that actually does deserve a gift. So, uh, Cade from Visual Impulse. Yeah, Yay! right here behind Cade. the camera. Does a great who's job. Who's pretending to ignore us? The king! <laughs> king Cade. King, king Cade. Cade back over here. So, um, one of our great cameramen uh, turns 18 today. How exciting. Oh, there he is. Look at it. Look at it, Cade. <laughs> You look so great. You look so dark. Wow, you've been out in the sun. Oh, there. So this is this is my memory of Cade. I, like the first like three or four times I saw Cade, not necessarily met him. He was asleep somewhere. He's like, got a stance. At at, uh, at at America Fest with the whole TBSA live setup. There's like a little like counter behind everything, and I was like looking for a place to charge my phone. So I found an outlet, and I looked down. There's Cade sleeping on the floor. He Love was. That. <laughs> No one zonks out like Cade. But when he is awake, he does an incredible job as a cameraman. <laughs> when he's awake. <laughs> Great work, Cade. Happy 18th birthday. Man, you make me feel old. <laughs> what a time to be alive. But hey, this has been a great show. Definitely a lot of fun. You want some more information about School Board Watch List, make sure you go to schoolboardwatchlist.org. You want good more, more information about how to fight the culture war? Probably follow Alex, follow Joe Bob, follow Anthony, and I guess you can follow me. John got into well. his closing <laughs> remarks with 30 seconds left. So That's he's, it. <laughs> See you guys. And you got to do all this rolling on and keep going. <laughs>
finally took action on people like you. You're going to burn as well. You're all going to burn. You f***ing think you're following the will of f***ing Jesus? You're following the f***ing devil, actually. You're just evil little f***ing people trying to control other people's lives. F***ing next time that f***ing bolt off, I hope it f***ing doesn't f***ing miss. I hope you all burn with it. That's what you deserve. <laughs> Wisconsin Family Action. The leading point of the pro-life movement. And this is one of those things, by the way, where when we're talking about this organization that's been hit by an act of domestic terrorism, violent domestic terrorism, the firebombing Molotov cocktail attack that burned their center down, and now death threats coming in being made to them. Understand what point in the movie we're in. That's why I always say this. That's why I always talk about this. That's what the left is willing to do. That's what the left is doing. And you got Governor Glenn Youngkin out there. I know it's a different state, but just listen to this. Governor Glenn Youngkin out there who campaigned as a strong conservative, and he's saying, we're going to issue a statement and we're going to call on the attorney general. This. You're the governor, sir. Govern. You say you're monitoring the situation. No, we're monitoring the situation and we're monitoring you. And we're monitoring the governor of Wisconsin. And we're monitoring the federal government and the local officials in Wisconsin as well. We're monitoring all of this. But that's the difference. That's what our job is. We're the front line. We're monitoring this stuff. We're getting the information out from groups like this that are in the field that are being attacked by Molotov cocktails. You got justices in their family homes with illegal intimidation efforts. And you guys are issuing statements. What do you think you were elected to do, sir? What do you think the people put you in that office for, sir? Do you think they put you there so you could go on TV and do interviews and then go on Twitter and issue statements? That's what I do, okay? And by the way, the rest of that audio, that disgusting audio that we just played for you, and I apologize for having to do that, but I need to show you what we're up against. You need to know what you're up against in this world. If you take a stand for life, if you take a stand for Christian values, if you take a stand for just traditional morality in this country. And we've got more of this audio, and I will put that out on my Twitter, because I'm monitoring the situation. That's my job. Your job is to do something about it. That's what you're put in place to do. It's this old thing. It used to be called the social contract. I guess we don't talk about that very much anymore. But this idea of people forming governments for, the, for collective defense so that there can be money allocated for that. And then units stood up to deal with these issues when they come across. Law enforcement, right? So my question is, by the way, and we broke the story yesterday about Jane's Revenge, the domestic terrorist group that's claiming this attack. Here's my thought. Go into the phone records of all these death threats and investigate every single one of these people. Go Dinesh D'Souza on this 2,000 mules level. Get the geo-tracking. Get the geofencing. See if any of those phone numbers were near the area of Wisconsin Family Action during the night of the attack. You should be tracking those cell phone numbers. You, you did that already, right? I'd say that to the authorities in Wisconsin, the FBI, to the DOJ, Merrick Garland. You, you pulled all the cell phone data that was around that area, that center in Madison, Wisconsin, for the entire 24-hour interval, right? Because people are casing it, people are coming in and out. That's what you would do for any investigation. And then you cross-reference that with all the phone numbers that are making death threats. This is basic stuff, just basic, you know, normal stuff that you would do when you have search warrants and you have a domestic terrorist attack. But you see what happens in this country. We don't treat these things the way they ought to be treated. We don't graduate. Instead, they go after journalists, they go after James O'Keefe, and they go after patriotic American citizens. Remember, he and his lover, Lisa Page. What a group. She's going to win. 10 million to one, she's going to win, I'm telling you, Peter. I'm telling you, Peter, she's going to win. Peter, oh, I love you so much.
I love you, Peter. I love you too, Lisa. Lisa, I love you. Lisa. Lisa. Oh, God, I love you, Lisa. And if she doesn't win, Lisa, we've got an insurance policy, Lisa. We'll get that son of a out. We got an insurance policy. Well, new DOJ notes are out revealing that the FBI was in a panic after President Trump tweeted that he knew he was being spied on. This comes to us via report in the Epoch Times by the great Jeff Carlson and Hans Mank, just two of the most finest. Uh, I mean, if you go and look on Twitter, go and follow Jeff and Hans immediately. Right. These guys, I believe they're both verified now through Epoch Times. They came up the hard way. They were grinding day in and day out, digging through the documents, putting together connections. I think it's so great, great to see these guys, to see their rise, to really go through. And they, they are the, um, you know, the crumb crunchers, right? They're the real crumb crunchers that are just, they're putting it all together. They're putting it all together and they're making it make sense. They're laying out the map. They're laying out the case. And then you've seen, by the way, in the Durham report and the Durham investigation, that Durham has come in and confirmed many of the findings that you would have known had you been following Jeff and Hans all along. So really, really just nothing but support for these guys. Uh, cannot say more about their research capabilities and their investigation capabilities. So let's get into the story. Newly released notes by taken by high-level DOJ officials all the way back in March of 2017. So put yourself way, way back there. Meeting with the FBI leadership, exposing some of the lengths the FBI engaged to cover up its spying on the 2016 campaign of then-candidate Donald Trump. The notes released by lawyers representing former uh, Hillary Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman as part of an effort to clear him on charges of having lied to the FBI. They do little to exonerate him, but provide quite a bit of information about the FBI. So this is that Sussman case that's being prosecuted by the Durham team the fact that he lied about working for the campaign. Of course he was working for the campaign, but he told the FBI that he wasn't. He said he was just doing it as a patriotic duty, right? It said that the FBI leadership already knew with near certainty that the Trump-Russia collusion claims were a hoax. They knew that Clinton's campaign had a plan to vilify Trump by portraying him as a Putin puppet. The FBI also knew that not a single claim in the so-called Steele dossier, which was the primary source of allegations of Trump-Russia collusion, had checked out. And they've got the back and forth notes to prove it. Because when he posted that tweet, they said they started freaking out. They were freaking out because they knew, they knew, obviously, that they had made the FISA warrant that was out there on Carter Page with the two hops on it. That means anyone he communicated to and anyone they communicated to. So the fact that they found out that the president knew about it, suddenly that became a huge issue for them, which, of course, one of the many things that led to the firing of James Comey just a few months later in May of 2017. So remember the timeline. We're at March of 2017. Then we go forward to May of 2017. I'll never forget that day. I was in the White House that day uh, that Comey was fired. Believe it or not, so I'm in the White House that day. And I was there with, uh, with, uh, with Tanya, um, who had, we had not been married at that point. We we're actually still, uh, we we're still dating. And we were a few days away from being engaged, believe it or not. She didn't know that yet, but I did. And we had just left the White House and we were going to get coffee right across the street when all of a sudden phone starts blowing up, right? James Comey, FBI director, has been fired. We run back in. We run into the, to the White House. We get into the press room. We're going live, right? Had no idea that the day would blow up like that. But that's just, you know, that's how the news cycle was during the Trump administration. You never knew what was going to happen next. And apparently, that was the day that I had. But even before that, the FBI knew that they had a problem because they had spied on a candidate for president and his campaign and now we're finding out that they used false pretenses to conduct that activity. Joe Biden does not care that fentanyl is invading our states. If, if you look at the population group between the ages of 18 and 45, the leading cause of death over the past year is not COVID, is not cancer, it's not car wrecks. The leading cause of death of our fellow Americans ages 18 to 45 is fentanyl. 
and President Biden is doing nothing to address that fentanyl problem. The fentanyl is coming in from China through Mexico into the United States. Joe Biden does not care that people are dying today. So we got $40 billion that we're sending to the war machine, right? Find you someone who loves you the way politicians love war spending. And we call it war spending, but it really is money laundering, right? Because a lot of that money comes back to them via um, campaign donations. And also if they have stocks in these companies the same way that I, we know, by the way, that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin came directly from the board of Raytheon, still has stocks. It's in a blind trust. It's in a blind trust. We know what you're doing. We know what you're doing. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi up there praising, please pray to St. Raytheon, the blessed the peacemaker, St. Raytheon, right? So we have $40 billion for that. Can't get any baby formula in this country. Can't get anything. If you go watch, by the way, Ashley St. Clair on Twitter has just been phenomenal on the baby formula situation. She goes all the way back to the Kennedy hearings in the 1970s, talking about what's going into the Similac, what's going into these other products. She was way ahead, way ahead of anything that Abbott has coming out now. Go back to Ashley St. Clair. Follow her, I believe, by the way, that she might be writing something for the Post Millennial all about this. But, but, all those problems going on here in the country, not to mention inflation, not to mention our border crisis, our border emergency. But what's the exacerbating incident when it comes to our border? Well, it's very clearly the fact that fentanyl is pumping across our border at an alarming rate. We had a president who said, why don't we bomb the drug labs? All for it. All for it. I'll give you $40 billion. I'll give you 50 right, to secure the border and actually go after the cartels. And the CDC is out today. Wall Street Journal has the story. Drug overdose deaths in 2021 topped 100,000 for the first time ever. U.S. history, a record high fueled by the spread of illicit forms of fentanyl throughout the country. Do you think they want to kill their customer base? Do you think they want to kill Americans? Because that's what they're doing. Find me someone that has killed more Americans in the past year, the past two years, the past five years, than the drug cartels and the CCP that's giving them the precursors for this illegal fentanyl. Because what people don't realize is that they're lacing street drugs and, um, and prescription drugs and synthetics from uh, with this fentanyl stuff. So they're putting in, you know, a couple, you know, a couple grams, a little bit here, a little bit there. Oh, we're just going to spice it up. We're just going to spice it up. Give it kind of, people are dying from it. They don't even realize what they're getting. They think they're just getting some prescription opioid, but it's really a, a pill of fentanyl or some kind of mix, right? It's leading to people dying. It's leading to kids dying. They're buying this stuff on Snapchat. They're buying it off of TikTok. We have a serious problem in this country right here. These are Americans, right? These are not people on the other side of the planet. These are not people that are on the, you know, some other planet, right? And I understand my heart, as a Christian, my heart goes out to everyone in the entire world. I wish that suffering didn't exist in this world, but it does. But from a governmental standpoint, the government of the United States exists to serve the interests of the people of the United States first. You put the American people first. That's what America first means. You put the American people first. Maybe we should change it to American people first. Because that's what it means. It doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you don't worry about what's going on in the rest of the world. However, that is an issue for their leaders. That is an issue in that region. Here at home, right here, 100,000 people were killed. Were killed by this illegal fentanyl. So you know what? Bomb the drug labs. Bomb every single pusher of this poison from across our border and back in. As I can see in the whole world, when you take away the freedom of the people, then also the religious freedom disappears. The Beijing government is accepted by, by Vatican, the Vatican accepts Beijing. They are very good friends, but we are in the question mark. We don't understand how uh, the Vatican can agree with Beijing on so many things. 
But again, we are excluded from the dialogue. Well, not only is the CCP have their 29 million strong open air prison in the city of Shanghai. They're increasing the lockdowns, by the way, in Beijing, the imperial capital. They're about to put that city under lockdown as well. You might have up to 400 million. But what are they doing in the free city of Hong Kong? Or I should say the formerly free city of Hong Kong. They're going after the priests. This is what communists always do. They always target the priests first because they know they know that communism and authoritarian control cannot survive with a competing ideology. They cannot survive if there is someone out there showing them the truth, teaching the Bible, teaching the word of the risen Lord, and bringing that to the people. So what do they do? They've arrested Cardinal Joseph Zen. We've got the story here. Cardinal Joseph Zen and four staffers were picked up by the Hong Kong police after an eight-month investigation into the 612 Humanitarian Relief Fund, which helped pro-democracy protesters pay for their legal and medical services. Zen was arrested and is being questioned, raided a cardinal in the city of Hong Kong. Hong Kong police and the Hong Kong Catholic Diocese have not issued any statement on the arrests. Zen, who was one of the Asia's most senior clerics, has spoken out against Chinese President Xi Jinping and the growing authoritarianism in China under his rule several times. Uh, a lot of pop singers, a lot of activists have pushed out against this. This is all about a law, that security law that was passed in 2020 that allows the government of Hong Kong and the police of Hong Kong to go after what they, who they deem a political dissident to the CCP. This is what total control looks like. What they're doing to Hong Kong, what they did to the free city of Hong Kong, that's what the party of Davos, the CCP, the Great Reset, the Schwabites, that's what they want for all of you. That's the type of authoritarianism they want here in the United States. You look at Hong Kong, you see where they want the U.S. in 20 years, or maybe even less than that. This is what happens when you have total control. Because, of course, they're not saying that has anything to do with his stand for freedom. Of course, they're not going to say he has anything to do, it has anything to do with his Christianity. No, no, no. They're going to say, well, he's a foreign agent. Oh, he was supporting foreign causes. They're going to call him spreading disinformation, extreme, right? They're going to come up with anything. They're going to find anything they can, right? Remember what the head of Stalin's secret police said. Show me the man, and I'll show you the crime. Show me the man, and I'll show you the crime. If they want you, they're going to find you, and they're going to come get you. So pray for Cardinal Zen. Pray for him, and pray for the people of Hong Kong. Pray for everyone that lives under the boot of the CCP. Pray for the people of Shanghai, too, and the people of Beijing, the Lao Beijing, the regular people. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve what the CCP is doing to them. These are the people that brought me into their homes. They taught me Chinese. They were my neighbors. They weren't involved in any of this. The Chinese people are the first victims of the CCP. The first victims of communism in China is them. And of course, just like in Russia, just like everywhere else, it's always the priests they come for first. And that's it for us today here, Human Events Daily. Now more than ever, your podcast for people who don't like podcasts, right? Our promise, our oath, our solemn vow to you. Be good, be brief, be gone. And of course, leave us with one, just one of your five stars. Excuse me. Share it with one of your normie friends and then leave us your five star. You can leave 10 five star reviews. Leave 100 five star reviews while you're at it. Seriously, one little quick review like that helps a lot, helps with our rankings, helps us with our metrics. What did we talk about today? First, the violent left leaving death threats for Wisconsin Family Action. We're breaking that story. Next, the new DOJ notes that came out revealing that the FBI's panic mode after President Trump tweeted about spying. Third, fentanyl fatalities hitting an all-time record. And finally, Hong Kong police on the orders of the CCP arresting Cardinal Joseph Zen. This is what they do. This is what the communist always does. They target the priests. They target the freedom fighters. They target the people who stand for the rule of law and the word of God. But before we go today, it's time for today's history break. And speaking of the rule of law, today, all the way back, we're going back a little far today, 1215 Anno Domine, May 12th, 
the spark that led to the Magna Carta being signed. The Magna Carta, one of the first enshrinings, really, of this idea of individual rights, of natural rights, came when King John's nobles rose in rebellion to him. See, King John took that whole divine right of kings very seriously, taxing the barons, doling out royal justice. However, what was different in this rebellion, this wasn't the first rebellion in England, what was different, though, was that they rose in rebellion to the king's rights and said, we have rights too. The Magna Carta eventually became one of the first writings anywhere to put this into practice. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, you have my permission to lay ashore. What if I told you that this has all happened before? The riots, the violence, the church burning, attacks on police, destruction of private property. My name is Sammy Steigman. I am a Holocaust survivor. This is the reality of what happens when you have capitalism that goes to socialism. El socialismo no funciona. El socialismo no funciona. What's poppin', everybody? Welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. We got a Sunday conversation with a couple of your favorite hosts. You listen to us every single week, but do you actually know us? So Brian and I were chatting. We're like, why don't we just start getting a little bit more open about who we are, where we came from, and our goal for the show? Because I know when we very first launched, we had basically just like a half an hour show for people that didn't know. We mm-hmm. had some people flying in across the country. We had some really, really big names. We had Steve Weatherford. We had David Akers, Tito Ortiz, Kenny Dobbs, who is an absolute beast in the streetball circuit. But it was just half an hour. In the first episode, we were talking a little bit more about who we were and, and where we came from. And I thought it would be a good time to just kind of open up about that. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, wow, thinking back to that, what was that last July that we were shooting all those? Such a different world for the for the world of, of Breakaway. As we speak right now, I think it was just over a year ago we did our very first pilot episode of Breakaway out at Turning Point USA HQ here in Phoenix. Arizona. Oh, the like test one. That's right. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, wow, that was a while back. And then I know you as well had asked on your your Instagram for people to send in send in some questions, and that's some stuff that we can we can, you know, uh, you know, actually answer those. And, and we should probably start doing that a little more, do a little more mailbag type type stuff. Let, let you know, the, the people determine what's going on with the show. Because mm-hmm. I think right off the bat, too, people are wondering, like, why is there a show like Breakaway? And for me, I didn't think there would be a need for a show like this in sports ever. I mean, I grew yeah. up watching Dream Job on ESPN. And for people that didn't know about that. I know we talked to Jason Romano. It was another great Sunday conversation, a former producer at ESPN. That was a whole show about, do you want to be a sports center anchor? For me growing up, I wanted to work there so bad. I wanted to be like, booyah. I wanted to have my own Stuart Scott moment. I wanted to have my own phrase. And then it got to a point when I was working in sports, I've always loved sports. Uh, first job out of college, Worked for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes, single A baseball team. Cody Bellinger was on the team, Kyle Farmer, a lot of really big time names in the Dodgers organization. Now Kyle Farmer's in a different different spot, but there I was just an in game host. But like, so yeah, because you, you've talked a lot about your your time with the Sharks. What was it that you were trying to do? Like, what was your like back then? Like, what was your like dream job? What, where did you want to end up? Because when I started in single A baseball, I knew that was just the start Mm because I interned at NBC Sports Bay Area during college and helped out the beat reporters specifically for the Oakland A's. And I helped out in studio. And my goal was to be working at a network. Mm. I wanted to be at Fox Sports. I wanted to be at ESPN. And once I moved from the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes in Southern California, just worked for them for a season. I started working for the Sharks minor league team that moved from Worcester, Massachusetts, out to San Jose. So they played in the same building, the Shark Tank, the SAP Center. And I knew that was going to be a great stop for me to really showcase my personality. Because for me, I love being around a crowd. I wish there was a live audience for this show every single time. I just thrive on that. Help with the laugh tracks. (laughs) So for me, I knew that that was going to be a big start. And then halfway through that first season, I got pulled up 
the Sharks didn't have an in-arena host, and I knew being an in-arena host was that place where I got 17,000 people there. I can also do some stuff on the digital side, so I can interview people. I can hype up the crowd. I can have a multitude of different opportunities to showcase my skills. And then once the Sharks pulled me up and ended up winning that job against two very, very capable women, I thought that was one of those things where this could really propel me to get into that next level and, and work in the network. And I did a few things with NBC Sports when I was in the Bay Area, but it got to a point where I was thinking about moving on with the Sharks and COVID hit. Yeah, like, well, I, I'm, I am curious, Doc, because I don't think you and I have ever really, really discussed it. COVID hit, so you lost your job, but what did that really mean for the world of, of like hockey, but not just, I guess, not even just hockey, but the world of people who had jobs similar to you because people across the country got gutted, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't just you. Yeah. And that was such a tough part of my life and a lot of people's lives because your livelihood is gone. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in sports, events, media, we didn't know what to do. And we knew there was a way we had to basically just adapt to the environment. And man, I'll tell you what, my identity has always been in Christ. And I know we definitely got a few questions about that that I can open up about. would love to hear a little bit more about your faith journey too. I know you've touched on that bits and pieces, mm. uh, being a Mormon and going on your mission. And, but when I got let go, man, that tore me apart. Jeez. Because I... Had you ever been fired before? Or like let go, fired, that I had world? Never, I'd never been let go before. I've definitely been broken up with. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for sure. Same, same. I, different. I'm the one that gets the heart broken. I'm not the heartbreaker. So I was like, that's the only thing I can <laughs> go back on. And uh, he, here. Um, wait, wait. Yeah, no. Uh, I'm sorry to derail you, but like, is there a specific bre <laughs> breakup in particular that like, like was, was particularly like funny or awful? Dude, this feels like politics now. Uh, or it just feels like the politics. spillover. Man, sports latex, dude. I, mean, I don't think basically there, there's there been times where I, I think I probably had like one relationship where it, it ended really bad. And I feel like the rest of them were just like, it's cordial. And we had it. We had our time, but it definitely was nobody pooped in, in the bed. No, there was no pooping in the bed. I was uh, Johnny Root, not Johnny Depp. And yeah, I don't think. I don't know if I feel comfortable opening up about okay. all this. That's if, fine. If just, I'm being see, completely honest. For me, maybe I'm a little more shallow, but there are certain times where I just like, you know, something gives me the ick where like I end things with girl. The probably the most shallow one was she liked glee. And I was like, yeah, it's just ain't gonna work out. <laughs> There's definitely parts of me where I'm like, man, if if, if we dating, you better like sports. Mm. Like you don't there is a there's a bit as a guy where you're just like, Oh, I'm gonna teach him. It's great. But I mean, I'll tell you what, there's been a couple couple times I've the most attractive trait other than loving Christ and being, you know, a, a great friend is man, a girl with a golf swing. Holy crap. I thought you were going to say an Oakland A's fan. I said, dude, you're <laughs> praying for a miracle. No, dude, I, I tell you what, dude, <laughs> dude, sorry to all the Oakland A's fans out there, man. There's been, there's some diamonds in the rough, but there is a lot of rough <laughs> <laughs> out there. Um, there's there's a lot better oh, yeah. Giants fans that are, that are good looking, but at that point too, when when I got let go from the Sharks, like I really realized I had some of my identity wrapped up mm. in that job. Because I tell you what, man, like it's I enjoyed interacting with a lot of people, dude. I signed jerseys, I signed arms, I uh, was basically like had a paparazzi around me at times in San Jose, if I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think I was anything special, but a lot of people knew me like, that's the Sharks guy. Yeah. Like I just saw him at, at brunch or like uh, we hit the town and then he was out there. I took a photo with this dude. And for me, it was, it was fun to be a little bit of a celebrity yeah. in San Jose. And I really don't feel like I let that go to my head too much. Because I think I do have to admit there was a part of me where I, I did enjoy that. I'm and king of San Jose. <laughs> But at the same time, too, a lot of people need to know that sometimes you see people uh, that are faces of an organization. Like you see an in-arena host. There's a lot of people that might be watching or listening. And they're like, oh, I, I go to a local game, and it seems like they're plastered all over this marketing material. They're on Instagram. They got a bigger following. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they know the players. It's a struggle, man, to get into sports media. That's what I always try to instill in people. I was not making... 
much money at all. I feel like season after season, I, I started to garner a little bit more respect. But you were probably yeah. making similar to like what the minor league uh, baseball players were making. Like dude, you were probably on par with them. Guys, dude, I was, and also knowing that I, I had to work, you know, like three, four jobs at times. And, you know, I, I tried to do a little bit of commercial acting and then I get a gig here and then I'd go work for the Sharks. And then I was also working for the Santa Cruz Warriors. So people see... So people see, I actually did a little bit of modeling. I know we got some producers back there. They've seen some of those photos. They put those at as the cover photo for some of our Telegram chats. We love them. And, you know, nothing gets them. people going. Speaking of modeling, I guess I'm modeling myself after Captain America. Yeah, you definitely have some Winter Soldier vibes going on right now, 100%. Producer Dom came in and told me that, and I was like, that's maybe the greatest compliment I've ever received. But But from there... Uh, honestly, it's like, it was, it's a lot of work and I don't feel like, Oh, feel bad for me. It's like, dude, you got to go through the grind because that only makes you appreciate reaching those heights and those goals even more. Mm. And, but when you have that stuff ripped away, there's a part of me, it's just like, all right, well, where do I go from here? I had to reinvent myself. So why Turning Point USA? Why did you decide you to reinvent yourself at Turning Point? I had no idea Turning Point was out in Phoenix, Arizona. I had no idea I was going to go out to Phoenix, Arizona, because yeah. once I lost my job with the Sharks, I ended up moving uh, to my parents' house. I tell you what, people, I love my parents, but I had not lived at home since summer after freshman year of college. I was always out on my own, and I never wanted to move back in because I saw that as taking a step back. Yeah. And, but the way I had to look at it is I think just I have to have this Christ-centered mentality of how I'm going to make the most out of this time. And this is the most time I'm ever going to spend with my parents like this the rest of my life. Sure, yeah. there was times where I'm like, I don't want to be here, and I want to be working, and I want to be hanging out with my buddies, and I don't want things to be so political. But I made the most out of that time, and I started a podcast with uh, two ringside reporters, mm -hmm. Abby Labar that works for Valley Sports and covers the Carolina Hurricanes. Shout out to Abby Labar. She's freaking incredible she is so good at what she does and we've been great friends ever since we flew out to boston to actually try out to be the in arena host mm -hmm. for the boston celtics Jeez. that was just an in and out trip and then i, I came back and uh hosted hosted a sharks game would you have had to have worn a leprechaun costume man i wish that would have been fun you know that would really get the people going a leprechaun with a microphone Ooh, baby and then um also had carolyn baith so she uh, works for the LA Kings. She's a ringside reporter with oh, them. Cool. And I think they're Valley Sports as well. Like two great women and talking to them, all right, what are we going to do? So we had a podcast called Sidelined. Mm. And we're like, this is perfect. We've been, talk we've been talking about uh, a podcast about how we can come together and talk about what's going on uh, in sports media. And dude, we had some great people on there. Paul Bizanet from Spit and Chicklets. Biz Nasty is the man. He, he is so funny, I think. Him, NHL on TNT has been really, really solid. Molly McGrath joined us as well. Cabby Richards, who works for Sportsnet in Canada. He's been a great mentor of mine. And know what's great about some of these people? It didn't matter about the politics. We literally talked about what's your sports media journey? What are you doing right now when you're not able to go into studios? And I think it found a, a lot of good success and it helped me hone my craft. And then I got to a point where I was working for Fanatics Mm -hmm. And some people know this story a little bit, and they are the major merchandiser for uh, sports leagues out here. So if you go to an Arizona Cardinals game, you yep. go to an L.A. Rams game, you go to a uh, Sharks game, it's going to be like, here's the Sharks store, a Fanatics experience. And I've had a relationship with them for years. And then um, once I moved out here, I was hosting some live shows for them. And DeAndre Swift was one of the interviews that I did, Detroit Lions running back. And I would just chat with him about, you know, anything. It would be fun. We'd bring in some people that bought some VIP passes to be a part of this Zoom call. And they had this whole, whole live show. And that was after I moved to Arizona. And I was actually working at Turning Point at the same time I was working for Fanatics. But nobody knew I was working at Turning Double Point. Double dipping. Because I was, I was like SEAL Team 6. I was like, all right, I moved out here. My buddies were like, dude, you can host remotely anywhere. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, great. So I can host some of these sports shows, still have my foot in the door here, and then do some good stuff for the conservative movement because I wasn't ready to come out as conservative, which is such a crazy thing to think about because mm -hmm. I knew being conservative didn't define me. 
But for a lot of executives and outlets and networks, that does define you. Yeah, it seemed to be like, oh, well, you know, let's uh, check this guy out, you know, but, oh, conservative. Yeah, we don't want any potential controversy. So we're just going to move on to somebody who's not. Because exactly. they'll, they'll go with the consensus thinking. So what ended up happening was while I was working here, I just felt like a lot more empowered so, you know, I had a lot of conversations with people. I wasn't really open about all this stuff on social media because, once again, it's career suicide. So the uh, advice that I give people, I'm like, you can't just go out guns blazing with this conservative stuff and be like, I don't get why I lost my job or I don't get why I uh, am just having tough conversations with people about this or I don't understand why people hate me. Like, people are so unbelievably emotional. But I thought for me, how can I post something that would still, you know, kind of keep me safe, but at least start some more conversations. So while working for Fanatics and being an undercover uh, TPUSA worker, not letting anybody know about that, our governor said, Governor DC here, and that was, that was last year, that was 2021, uh, pretty early 2021, said that individuals and businesses decide for yourself when it comes to masking. So for me, I was like, I hate going to the gym and wearing a mask. Because I really don't feel like the science stands up that we're really keeping each other safe and that this is actually really good for me. So I was like, great. He came down yeah. with this order. So I went to East Sporta, my gym out here. Well, and gyms were one of the first ones to jump on of immediately. They went, okay, optional. Like it's our choice. So mm -hmm. you guys don't have to wear them anymore. Exactly. So I show up there and then for me too, like what I normally did was I'd walk into a business and I'd ask them, like, do, you, do I need to wear a mask? So I asked people at the front. Hey, do I need to wear a mask? They're like, no, you guys don't need to wear a mask. We still are as, as workers, but feel free to decide for yourself. What a concept. But from there, I was like, dude, there was a few people I interacted with at the gym, not just white, blonde hair, blue eyes, like right wingers. You know, there were some people like there was this one Hispanic dude that was like, he came up to me. He's like, dude, he's like. I can't believe it. He's like jumping up and down. He's like, this is great. Like he said, I'm yeah. free. I was like, this is cool. And I, so Jim mirror selfies never look good. So I, but for me, I was just like, the hell, I'm not going to ask somebody to take a photo of me. Yeah. Here, you'll, you'll get that real quick. Uh, yeah, make work. sure to get quick pump in before you take the picture. <laughs> oh, for sure. Definitely uh, had so. to just do a couple, couple curls and then curls for the girls. How much, wait, 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 how much can you curl? Dude, I have no idea. Cause I don't, I never max out when I curl. Okay. I feel like it's usually. Well, what's your what's your what's your standard? Like, what are you curling on on a regular basis? I mean, yesterday when I was curling, if I'm doing, I'm usually doing like a four by twelve, like set. I do like super sets usually, yeah. so usually going to be like thirty five. Okay, because I see those like absolute beefcake dudes at the at the gym who they are like grabbing like nineties, mm -hmm. <laughs> and those are my favorite people at the gym, dude. That's you know I aspire to be those, them one day. Those people are bonkers. Like, I for, love those guys. Those guys freaking meatheads. I, I, so I was just trying to, I was trying to, trying to qualify how much of a meathead is, is John Root. <laughs> but yeah, no, so you take how much of a meathead, you take this, you know, Jim Mir selfie thinking nothing of it. And then I post it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And for me, I post it on Instagram and Twitter. And I think I posted on Facebook as well, just all my platforms and basically just ended up saying, you know, thank God I live in a place where I can decide for myself. Um, thank God for freedom of choice. People, people lost their mind. Simple as that, because that was during a time where people literally thought that I was killing people. I was called the worst names. People were definitely, they were throwing out death threats to me. They're saying, I That's hope crazy. I, they, they said, I, I hope this guy, this white supremacist dies. I hope this like Nazi looking dude's family <laughs> is murdered. Of course. And right, I mean, this kind of stuff where it was, just, it was just so emotional. And for me, I was like, wow, this backlash is crazy. But the way my mind was working was, this is also funny because people were making, trying to make fun of me for my legs. I don't really feel like, I don't <laughs> have chicken legs, but man, there was some really, really funny comments that I got or replies. Oh, so. All right, let's take a quick break from our conversation and talk about food. One of my favorite parts of my life. It's a huge part of the sports experience as well. What if you could buy food you need for your watch party and donate to TV USA without even leaving your home? You'd say, John, get the F out of here. But you can do that now with Good Ranchers. 
They sell 100% American meat, and they believe so much in what we're doing right here at Turning Point USA. They're going to donate 50 buckaroos to TPUSA on your behalf when you purchase from them. Good Ranchers delivers steakhouse quality beef, chicken, and seafood right to your door. And with our code TPUSA, you can donate $50 to our mission while getting absolutely delicious food. You can probably hear my stomach rumbling right now. Head on over to GoodRanchers.com slash TPUSA today. Ribeyes, New York strips, gourmet burgers, and so much more good, good stuff. Order now with promo code TPUSA and $50 will be donated to our mission of sharing and preserving true American values, which make sports great. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash TPUSA to get a box today. Once again, use promo code TPUSA at GoodRanchers.com slash TPUSA. Do good while you eat good. Now back to our conversation. What I did the next day was, you know, I've been really thinking a lot about what you guys said. And when people read that, they're like, oh, he's going to apologize. He's going to bow down to the woke mob. This was a picture of me at the leg press. I said, I've been thinking a lot about what you guys said. I've decided not to skip leg day. Thanks so much for keeping me accountable. And people lost it because I'm like, I got him. But from there, it led to that that was like a full weekend of just like, I'm going to troll these people. And I think a lot of people were just like, this is fine. Like he's allowed to do it. This, this is legal. And he's, I'm not saying that COVID's fake. I'm not trying to undermine what anybody else has gone through. And I, I mentioned that in the comments too. I replied to a bunch of people. I think pretty much everybody, uh, except for the people that called for violence or something like that, that don't deserve a response. Yeah, no, no. I got a call on Monday from fanatics and they said that you're not going to be hosting the next show. And that show was going to be with Andy Pettit, so legend, legendary Yankees player. And I asked them for a reason why. They wouldn't give me a specific reason. They said, well, it's just a decision made by higher-ups. I'm like, well, then let's talk to higher-ups. And it's like, well, it doesn't seem like you were properly vetted. And I was like, what are you talking about? We've had a relationship for years. So, like, don't beat around the bush because I know this has nothing to do with skill set because you've literally said these are some of the best meetings and shows that you guys have had. And from there, they're like, you know, it's just a decision. I hope you just kind of keep us in mind in the future and we'll let you know. I was like, you are literally just putting me in a limbo period. That's it. You aren't actually like really letting me go. So I said, um, so what, what's the real reason here? It's like, you know, it's just decisions been made. So I'm like, all right, if this is not going anywhere, I'm going to hang up the phone. I was so heated. I was, I, I, there was a part of me that's like, yes, yeah, sure, I understand there might be a little bit of backlash. And especially as fanatics, they're a big growing brand. Like there's, there's a lot of investment there, but I ended up sending an email. I was just like, from my understanding, you guys said I'm not hosting the next show. You said there's potential for opportunity in the future. I'd like to talk to the person that made the decision um, because it seems like I'm not getting a real answer. Just got a fluff response. That was the end. From there, I was like, F it, let's roll. Let's talk about the wokeness in sports, and I'm sick and tired of being silent. Well, and so that's what, well, as you're saying that, it was making me think. Obviously, do you think that this, like, they, they of course, were getting rid of you because they're like, oh, well, now he's an open conservative. We didn't realize that before. Gone. Did Do you think that pushed you to a new level of your, like, willingness to be politically active? 100%. And so I, I, I kind of think that that is something that is an unintended consequence of what they've been doing over the last two, three years, because it's, it's not a singular story of just John Root. I feel like, you know, some of the, uh, you know, women who we've, we've talked to in, in women's sports who are being, you know, attacked through all of that stuff. And then just like people seeing the wokeness on and off the field, but then just take it to the, you know, outside of that. I feel like it's the, the unintended consequence that these people are doing is that they are, you know, empowering, empowering is not really the right word. They're awakening these people to they're going, hey, you know what? No, actually, this is a way worse situation than I thought. I am willing to be way more outwardly vocal about what I believe. Well, the thing is, you have this specific woke mob, and I'm just going to bring that up. A lot of people are just like, well, why do you constantly just bring up politics? And I was like, well, when there's politics involved in it, I will bring it up. I think politics and sports has absolutely ruined sports. It's made people turn out in the millions, uh, tune out in the millions, excuse me. Uh, People are stopping buying league passes. They're not buying jerseys or merchandise. They're not going to games. And then you have people like me where my entire life was sports and trying to grow in my craft and trying to get to the next level. So 
I thought there was a part of me where I need to be silent. I was terrified to like a Ben Shapiro or Charlie Kirk tweet or anything conservative yeah. because I knew that would show up on timelines and potentially I would lose out on, on opportunities. So, but people like this specifically, this has been a great place to come talk about the women's sports issue. I don't think there's any other podcast out there that's had the caliber of guests or the conversations that we've had. And a lot of it comes down to people have been silenced. And luckily we have a show like this that we've been able to come together. And I'm so thankful for you jumping yeah. on board here. I think it's we got we got to talk about uh, that background a little bit. But that's why this show is so important. Like we just got to make sure that we amplify some of these voices so we can have more conversations and figure out how do we make sports better? And if we make sports better, I think that can make society and culture better because just like um, we talk about Andrew Breitbart, the downstream, the I think there is an aspect of sports that it can really make an impact in our country and in the entire world. And if we lose sports, I think we start losing society and culture. Well, and so you say that because obviously, you're, you know, you reference Breitbart's, you know, uh, politics is downstream from culture. Do you think culture is downstream from sports? I think not, not specifically. Okay. I, I wouldn't say it's like a, a perfect analogy, but mm -hmm. I think sports makes such a massive, massive influence on culture. Yeah. And specifically because it brings people together unlike anything else. And I think that's the reason that we're both in sports. It's an outlet away from politics, the craziness of the world. But there's times where people look to sports for some sort of comfort. Think about 9-11. 9-11, something that a lot of people will bring up, tens of millions of people will bring up George Bush throwing out the first pitch. Yeah, it was a great moment for the country. Everyone loved it. And then you talk about um, some of these football games. You have a massive flag out there. You got, I forget the guy from the, the Packers, but you know ran out with an American flag. These are things where it's just showing like, hey, we are the United States of America. We are together in sports. We are going to look to sports as an outlet and as a comfort. But right now, we don't look to sports as an outlet or a comfort anymore. Maybe people look to it as a comfort as an affirmation and a validation of their crazy politics, people coming out with an American flag and uniting after a terrorist attack or something, that's not a political statement, in my opinion, at all. I think that's no. just, I think it's just an American statement saying like, hey, hey, we are coming together and sports can make such a massive impact on society. And it's not even just pro sports. You, thought, you talk about just growing up in sports throughout your life, you wanna make sure you have coaches, mentors and mm -hmm. people around you that instill teamwork, determination, grit, uh, how to basically interact uh, with other people. There's a lot of stuff that you learn and skills in sports that people need to learn. But right now people are just tuning out. Absolutely. And, and not, to, not to backtrack, but I want to I highlight on something you, you said a couple of minutes ago. You mentioned about the dip that we saw during 2020 in sports when that was when the wokeness in sports exploded, but there was also a number of other, other factors. Now, since then, you know, we're in 2022 now, uh, the, the numbers have all risen back. Like they're, they're back. People are watching sports. Um, do you think that America as a whole, you know, kind of just got over the fact of the wokeness in sports and kind of acclimated to it? Or do you think the leagues pulled back on how much wokeness was going on there? Because like, exactly, like, yes, people stopped buying jerseys and they stopped watching. But frankly, the people who are, were always going to be gone, like they're, they're gone or they're maybe a little, little bit of them came back. But for the most part, like the viewership numbers are completely back to where they are. So what do you think happened? It's pro sports scaled back big time. Okay. And because obviously you can't keep that runaway train going <laughs> forever. You know, it's, it's yeah. going to find a stop. It's going to go off the rails, and it went off the rails. It did. Because you can't have the, the NBA boycotting games all the time just because they think that there was some sort of injustice in the world, like the Milwaukee Bucks. I mean, now we find out that, like, you know, Jacob Blake, like, we knew at that time that you had the knife, and he wasn't innocent, and he raped uh, his baby mama. Things like that where that's what you're going to boycott a game for. And people saw that. They're like, this is your idol? Yeah. This is the person you're going to highlight? And that's when people tuned out. And then with the NBA, they decided, like, we have to, we got to get rid of Black Lives Matter off the court. We got to stop having social justice nonsense talked about 
all the time. There's bits and pieces of that that are still there. Do you know where Black Lives Matter still exists, the logo within the world of sports, big time? Well, I mean, I know that the University of Michigan had that on their jersey during March Madness. But, but right now, like, uh, when you watch, what is, what is the greatest show on television sports-wise currently? Well, you got NBA and TNT, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, inside the NBA TNT, it's in the background. Uh, over at Look Over, where Shaq and Ernie sit in the back, it is still there. They still the, have it there? They still have it. Man. That's what I'm saying. But oh, Remember, TNT is CNN. It's it, yeah. that's all that's Turner. all you know uh, interconnected, and so that's where it's just funny because yeah, exactly, and that's why you know I did I did you know ask you leading a little bit, but yes, like the the league scaled back big time because of how much of a disaster it was in the COVID year, um, but we are still like there is an element of it that isn't going away anytime soon. Like there there's an element of it that that is here to stay, and that's why unfortunately I know you and I. Uh, we've said it many times. We wish we would never talk about any politics in sports. Like we wish yep. it could be, you know, uh, like how the majority of, of sports conversations used to be. However, the reality is that the other side is majorly engaging in this. I mean, you have what Bleach Report is doing, who is also part of TNT. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, what Bleach Report is doing with, <laughs> with people like Taylor Rooks and whatnot. Uh, you People have like Bomani media. Jones has a show on HBO. Which is performing terribly, but it just got extended to a season two because it tells the message that they're trying to get out. Because they don't want to be called racist. That's it. You have people that he's literally Jamel Hill, the mm -hmm. male Jamel Hill yeah. in, in sports media. He's one of, I think it's maybe the worst rated sports show over the last It's decade. not even getting 50,000 views. Uh, YouTube show, the Pat McAfee show, is getting better numbers than Bomani Jones Network HBO show is, yet it just got extended. And ask yourself why. Why is Pat McAfee getting so many views? Obviously, he's an incredible personality. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a few things he might talk about politics-wise. Like, obviously, here, we are going to slant right. And I think it's important because yeah, but I mean, even even Pat McAfee, he he's probably a moderate, but I think he slants right. Yeah, and but he's someone that just he gives you fun sports news oh, all yeah. the time. He's got, uh, I mean, Aaron Rodgers wants to come on his show every single Tuesday. You know, probably the biggest personality in and in the NFL on the field. Yeah, like that's who they want to hear from. And Aaron Rodgers is going to go there all the time. AJ Hawk wants to work with him. He has a great group around him. We have a great group here. At, at Breakaway, everybody putting these shows together, help throwing out a few different ideas. Dom throwing out some nice little uh, comments about how I look like Captain <laughs> America. Always appreciate that stuff. I think the reason why people are gravitating towards a Pat McAfee or who is kind of the new one, we were kind of just talking about him right before the show, J.J. Reddick. And J.J. Yep. Reddick is referencing Draymond Green because even though I don't agree with, like, look, J.J., dude, he went to Duke, okay? J.J., Yikes. Draymond is, 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 is lefty. However... The reason why on a sports level, people are gravitating towards, you know, Pat McAfee, JJ, Draymond. One, I think the fact that they are former players is a big deal. I, I think it is. People mm -hmm. are kind of sick of the the um, the blog boys. Um, well, because that's why there's an aspect of, I know when we covered Jeff Garcia talking about Mina Kimes. Yeah. Like, Mina Kimes, she's a good football mind, no doubt. But there's always going to be this criticism if you didn't play professionally or you didn't play at a high level. Like, I deserve to be criticized. I hope that bringing up some of my background and some of my yeah. credibility helps me as a sports media professional. But I know if I, I keep reaching up that I'm going to get rightfully so criticized because I didn't play at a super high level. I was a, uh -huh. I was a punter for a D2 team. Um, and let's go. Zuzu Pacific, Pacific, baby. No let's longer, go. No longer got a football team there. Um, but at least they went out on top with Ruth the Boot, baby. Yeah. But I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get criticized. But there's new sports media personalities like JJ Redick, who got a great podcast. Draymond Green has uh -huh. got a solid podcast. But because you know, they're real, that's why people like them. Yeah. But also, like you mentioned, Mina Kimes. Do you think she is the most protected voice in sports right now? Like it. Whenever anybody comes out comes after her critically whatsoever, the entire like sports media world because remember it's very similar to comedians remember when uh when will smith slapped chris rock comedians as a whole like they banded together and were like screw will smith we all have chris chris rock's back there's a certain extent 
where the the sports media people, these journalists and whatnot, they 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 they're an in group, they're a tribe, so they get each other's back. And Mina Kimes says ridiculous stuff culturally, sports wise. I actually agree with a lot of her takes, um, but she says some ridiculous stuff culturally. But then as soon as somebody starts to criticize her, bubble wrap comes around and everybody rushes to her defense. It's kind of crazy. I don't know if there's anybody else who is as protected in the world of sports. Maybe LeBron, but even LeBron gets some criticism. Yeah, LeBron's always going to get some criticism, but he's the kind of guy, it's like he's a good businessman. And, yeah. you know, he's, he's a family guy. And there's some things like he hasn't gotten in trouble. So, like, I've always said that, that I can admire that about LeBron is like, Obviously, he's pulled so much nonsense, and I am so far on the other side compared to him politically. But there's some things that attract people to LeBron, and he's just going to be one of the best athletes that we ever see in our lifetime or maybe even ever. So when we think about sports media personalities, Maria Taylor, she was mm. definitely this huge thing that was going on. She she wants to get more money here, and then is she going to stay at ESPN or are they going to pay her? And if they don't, we got... Uh, ESPN that might be called racist. And then is she going to go to NBC Sports? I don't think she was as protected as Mina Kimes. Um, but I know you probably got about like five minutes or so, yeah? Yeah. You got about five minutes. So I do want to transition uh, a little bit here and, and talk about you. Sorry that the last five minutes is... that's. Oh, that's I'm not interesting, John. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, but I, I think people need to know, uh, especially here when we talk about like media personalities, uh, hopefully people are just really enjoying this show and hearing authentic conversations about what's going on in sports. So I know when I was first building out this show, it was, you know, a little bit different feel. So I'm like, yeah. well, I'm happy to, you know, do some interviews. I can do some stuff on my own at times, but I always enjoy kind of having a partner. I mean, all the major sports shows, they got someone else with them. You know, it's a Pat McAfee show, but dude, he's got like seven guys with him. And then AJ Hawk jumps on at times. And then the major sports shows that you see on, on Fox Sports and ESPN. There's there's more people there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had some people, shout out to Marcus, no longer here at Turning Point USA. He's R. like, R. dude, I was like, dude, you need to talk to Brian. Brian's a big sports guy. And for me, I was like, all right, well, that would be great as long as someone's like fairly competent. I'm going to give him a try. And, and let's see. The first time we sat down and had conversations about sports, and I know you, you guys hear this all the time if you're tuning into the podcast, you're just in tune with what's going on um, on the field, in the stat sheet, and culturally, I feel like you have you have a mind for those kind of things, and it's not even a mind, but you got you got a love for that stuff, and I feel like that's what made this show thrive and us work so well with the show so far. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, yeah, because I, you know, I I love to go after the the sports media personalities and journalists and whatnot because uh, even though I'm sitting here doing this with you. <laughs> That's not what I am, dude. I, I am literally a fan sitting behind the mic. That is all I am. And, and yeah, like obviously as you were referencing, um, it's because I was I was in this network already. My background, obviously nothing to do with sports whatsoever. I have been over the last four years, I've been working with Charlie and that's why I'm you know involved here with, with things to doing with Turning Point USA. I work on the Charlie Kirk show and, and assist over there. And so being you know, around the world of, of like podcasting and radio and whatnot, that's not entirely new to me. However, uh, actually being behind the mic, that is. However, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been fun to be able to do this. And, and like I said, I'm a fan. That's r literally all I am. I have no qualifications whatsoever other than the fact of I love, I love, you know, sports. I love the meritocracy of it. I love the idea of being able to build and construct teams and how, how teams work. And it is just, it's something that's truly, truly special, the world of sports. And it's something that I hope we don't lose, but obviously it's something that, that, you know, over the last few years, it's, it's been, are we losing this? Are we losing the magic of it while the business of it continues to grow? And I think that's, what's fun about this show. And with you, it's like, we don't take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> not at all. Like we're not, we're not going to, it's like, obviously I'm going to give you my credibility. I'm going to give you my background, but I'm not going to be on this this high horse of like, oh, don't you ever criticize me. Don't you ever criticize these takes. Like people need to be able to be in our shoes. And I think especially you being on the show, they're like, yeah, I'm a huge fan too. But you mm. have great takes and you have a good mind for this stuff. And they're like, oh, I understand that too. Those are, those are the conversations I'm having with my friends or my buddies oh, yeah. or a group chat or whatever's going on. Here's how you can view it as a fan. And I think that, that stuff's kind of fun because 
the way sports media's landscape is going, we are so used to just raw reactions. Obviously, yeah. for us, we do a hell of a lot of research. We make oh, yeah. sure we work really, really hard for every show that we are competent in what we say. There's definitely times where I'll say stuff off the cup, and I'm like, off the cuff, and it's like, well, that actually wasn't that accurate, and they hope that we uh, fix fix that a little bit later. Well, what always gets me is is saying the wrong name. <laughs> My goodness. But I mean, that's that stuff happens, yeah. and 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 that's okay. And I think here, as we continue to build this show, like really emphasizing for everybody watching and listening that there's a show like this that's always been needed. Clay Travis, he did a great job with Outkick the Coverage, but now he's with Buck Sexton. You know, Outkick the Coverage, their whole website, they do a great job. We've had a few people from there on the show, but there is a cultural aspect inside of sports and politics in sports where you need to hear the right side of the conversation. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to beat you over the head with right-wing politics, but if there's times where they're going to talk about the Rooney rule, it's like we're going to talk about what that means for culture and society. Is is this actually a good thing? Or you have LeBron say something, or you have some other athlete or organization or coach say something. We're going to say, here's how you can view this because you're basically just getting, and we're not here to indoctrinate people. We're here to educate people on the other side of the conversation because I feel like there's places like ESPN. We're going to bash on it a lot. Because I feel like you got one side that is all you're getting. And we hope, especially with the conversations we have here on Sunday, shows we have during the week, that's like, hey, this is what this means. And here's our opinion as well. We can have an opinion without being canceled. And that's a blessing. Absolutely. Well, it's been a lot of fun, John. It's definitely been a lot of fun. Brian, you are the man. Everybody, thanks so much for tuning into this Sunday conversation. Hopefully you enjoyed getting to know both of us a little bit more. If you are not subscribe to us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Press the bell. You'll get notified for all our great content we have every single week. You can follow us on Instagram at TPUSA Breakaway. If you don't like looking at our faces, I don't understand <laughs> why, but if you just want to listen, you can listen to us on Apple and Spotify. Make sure you follow us, subscribe, leave a five-star review. Brian Farnsworth, thank you so much. Twice. I'm John Root. Go sports. This is your brain. This is your brain on socialism. Any questions? What's up, bitch? Were you bending over to get my attention? Because it worked. This is my baby. What's his name? Sean. Or Liam. I mean, Sean. Hi. Do you think he looks like me? Yeah. Would you consider me a mill? I think so. Well, I'm Jerry. No ring on the finger. My right hand. Just an observation. You know how our parents always hear new music and they say, well, they just don't make songs like they used to. That's how I feel about reality TV shows. But low key, if you have kids and live in a rich neighborhood, I would like to push your baby around on a hot girl walk just to see if I would fit in. You know, a little trial run, if you will. The hot girl walk is just a four mile walk where all you think about is how hot you are, things you're grateful for, and all of your goals, hopes, and dreams. Amanda Seyfried shared that after playing Karen in Mean Girls, she had boys constantly being creepy and saying this to her. Maren Morris's son trying spicy food for the first time is so cute, I have to show you. Would you be excited for High School Musical 4? Zac Efron said whether he would be down or not. And there's a new goldfish cracker flavor that has me shook on if we should be smiling back or if they're smoking crack. Say crack again. Crack. I'm Alex Clark, and this is Poplitics.
The first time you watched Mean Girls was your favorite character, Katie, Caddy, Gretchen, <laughs> Regina, or Karen? I'm Karen, you are so stupid. Marie Claire sat down with Amanda Seyfried for an in-depth interview on her career and different films she's been a part of. And the whole interview is really good, especially if you love the dropout on Hulu like me. But they also talked to Mean Girls and I thought what she had to say was pretty juicy. You wanna do something fun? You wanna go to Taco Bell? When Mean Girls first came out, guys would come up to Amanda and ask her if it was raining since, you know, her character Karen could predict the weather with her breasticles. I'm kind of psychic. I have a bit sense. What do you mean? It's like I have ESPN or something. My breasts can always tell when it's gonna rain. Really? That's amazing. Amanda said, I always felt really grossed out by that. I was like 18 years old. It was just gross. A hilarious part of this interview was that she said every time she walks into her current building, her doormen go, do the voice, do the voice. And they're talking about the Elizabeth Holmes voice she did in the dropout. And so the reporter in this interview asks Amanda, when they ask, do you do it? And Amanda goes into the voice and says, yeah, I've always loved her. Forward, forward. This is an inspiring step forward. Mary Morris's two-year-old son, Hayes, eating a spicy oregano leaf is my new aesthetic. Here, buddy. <laughs> Be honest, were you a high school musical fan, girl? <laughs> Full disclosure, I was not. I just don't really do musicals, you know? And the fashion, I was not impressed. Maybe this is a controversial opinion, but if I'm gonna watch a movie about high school, there either needs to be a Regina George or a serial killer. Sharpay is not Mean Girl Middle Ground. I just ate a peanut. But if you were, you'll be excited about this. I think Zac Efron is down to do a High School Musical 4. All right. Of course, of course. I mean, um, yeah, I... I Seriously, it's it's to, it, having the opportunity to in any form go back and work with that team would be so amazing. Um, yeah, my heart's still there, so that would that would be incredible. I hope it happens. TBH, if they're going to do another movie, they should just do it while all the stars are still somewhat young and hot. Ten year high school reunion, hot. Twenty year reunion, not. We're all in this together. Yes, we are. We're all stars. That means something, you know it. I posted to my personal Instagram story over the weekend that I had discovered flaming Hot Cheetos Mountain Dew and that it was Satan's diarrhea. I'm all jacked up on Mountain Dew. But there is a new collab in town and it's with Pepperidge Farms Goldfish this time. Remember those sweet, warm New England summers? Remember sipping lemonade underneath a shady tree? Remember when you hit that pedestrian with your car at the crosswalk and then just drove away? Pepperidge Farm remembers. But Pepperidge Farm ain't just gonna keep it to Pepperidge Farm sell free of charge. Maybe you go out and buy yourself some of these distinctive Milano cookies. Maybe this whole thing just disappears. Goldfish crackers are collabing with Old Bay Seasoning. I want to get my hands on this so bad and try it. I love Old Bay, I love goldfish. Side note, do the colored ones turn your poop green? Asking for a friend. Goldfish. I want to give you a hint on who's coming up on The Spillover tonight, but first, make sure you heart or thumbs up this episode, depending on where you're watching. Discuss your hot girl walk routine, if you would be down for a High School Musical 4, and if you think Old Bay Goldfish sounds good, what do you think the best reality show of all time is, by the way? Post today's episode to your story with a poll and ask people if Nicole Richie is you as a mom and then hit the save button. Also, we are still testing out the episodes coming out at a later time this week to see if you prefer 4 p.m. Eastern or 6 p.m. Eastern better. Your hint on the guest for The Spillover this week is actually that it's two guests. They are considered very controversial in the influencer space and are also quite famous for their celebrity family drama. Any guesses? We're back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific as we try this new time out. It's pop culture without the propaganda every single day. I'm Alex Clark and this is Politics.
clearly Poplitics is best served visually, but you can also listen to Poplitics if you just want the audio. Subscribe to us anywhere you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, and more. Also, make sure that if you are listening to the podcast version, you leave us a five-star review. And don't forget, subscribe to Poplitics on YouTube.